on behalf of the Wireless Broadband Alliance, we would like to say a warm hello to everyone and welcome to the Wireless Global Congress Summer Webinar Series. Your webinar is about to commence and all attendees will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the webinar. After each presentation, there will be a question and answer session. So please, if you have any questions you would like to raise, put them into the questions pane on your control panel, which you'll find at the top right-hand side of your screen. I would now like to hand over to your host of this webinar, Mr. Chris Bruce, Managing Director of Global Reach Technology and Board Member of the WBA. Well, thank you, Sarah, and a warm welcome to you all. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining this Wireless Global Congress brought to you by the WBA. If you were um, with us yesterday for the kickoff of the plenary session, you will know that this is one of a series of uh, webinars that we'll be holding this week at the same time at 4.30 UK time. Um, and then after this week, we will then be holding similar sessions every Wednesday throughout July. Um, normally, of course, we'd be meeting together, uh, this time in Chicago, as we meet um, three times a year in different parts of the world. But unfortunately, COVID uh, put pay to that. But um, no, no matter, we've, we've managed to put on a really fantastic event yesterday. And today, we've got a really fantastic set of qualified speakers for you. Uh, to talk on the subject of six, um, six gigahertz and the Wi-Fi 6 Wi-Fi technology. Um, and I'm delighted that we've got such an excellent set of speakers for you. So, um, before I start in the presentations, I uh, would like to thank our sponsors, uh, without whom uh, it would be difficult to, to put on this event. Um, primarily our charter sponsors, Cisco, Intel and Boingo, all been long-term supporters of the WBA and um, contributors to the work that we do. Um, also like to um, recognize the Diamond sponsors, Cognitive, uh, my own company, Global Reach, um, On Semiconductor, Huawei, uh, Yconnect, Maxima Telecom and STL. Again, all contributors to the work of the WBA. Uh, we're more than um, an event. Uh, we put on events, we put on very good events, but really the work of the WBA is about coming out with a result, changing the world, and in our instance, changing the way people connect to Wi-Fi networks and move from cellular networks to Wi-Fi networks and making that experience um, easy and secure. So um, you'll hear more about the work we do today because we're specifically talking about the Wi-Fi 6 trials program. So we produce, we produce papers, we produce white papers, but essentially the output of what our work is to test that this technology works in the wild, um, in situ with different technologies working together under an operator's uh, aegis. And that's what we want to hear about today, how that's getting on. So uh, as I mentioned, a fine set of uh, speakers today uh, from leading companies, Intel, Huawei, uh, from an enterprise company, Metis Aerospace, in the uh, uh, aerospace industry, uh, Cisco, Boingo, On Semiconductor, Broadcom, and Comscope. So you've really got a very, very good selection of companies there represented that are expert in this in this space. So um, I'm delighted to to do a, uh, an introduction here. Uh, I've been um, a member of the board of the WBA for over 10 years. Um, initially with my previous company, British Telecom, but now with Global Reach Technology. Our, our interest here is that we are a software company, and services company that enable users connect to the network, Wi-Fi networks easily and securely, and manage the identity on their behalf and their venue's behalf. Uh, for the WBA, um, if you don't know us or you're not a member, then perhaps after this, you, you'll think about joining us and joining our mission. We represent a wide ecosystem of operators from across the globe. Our charter and our constitution of the board is that there are three members from Asia, three from the Americas and three from Europe as operators joined by technology partners who help us on our journey to make this reality of a seamless and easy connection to Wi-Fi networks uh, a reality. And you'll see there a, a strong selection of operators and technology partners in the association. This year we've seen a significant increase in new members 
And I think honestly, driven by the work you're gonna hear about today in Wi-Fi 6, and also the Open Roaming Initiative, which was announced recently, and that we'll be talking more about on our webinar tomorrow, this time tomorrow. Um, as I mentioned, we're not purely a, a, um, an events organizer. We produce work and we use the event as a showcase for our work. Um, if you're interested in the program, there's a, there's a rich array of different programs and projects that, that we run. Um, but we're here today to talk about Wi-Fi 6 and the progress in real live trials uh, of Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. Um, as I mentioned, you'll hear more about open roaming tomorrow. Um, we've also done a lot of work with um, regulators explaining the benefits of Wi-Fi 6 and the use of 6 gigahertz. And if you were joined the webinar yesterday, you'll have heard uh, Chairman Pai of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission in the US, and he and his commissioners have unanimously approved the use uh, of 1200 megahertz of spectrum in the white in the six gigahertz band which will transform the um, the use of wi-fi in the us and will really allow um, users in the us to really take advantage of the power of wi-fi 6. Um, i know other countries are looking into this and um, ofcom is in the middle of a consultation in the uk for something similar uh, and other countries around the world so uh, we encourage those regulators to take a look at what the US has done um, and, and the power that that's going to unleash for the, the economy and for innovation. So uh, without further ado, just a little word on, on from you. So I want to make this an interactive session. Uh, there'll be questions from um, uh, the, there'll be questions from uh, uh, for you uh, at the end of every session, but initially I'd like to find out who you are. So if you could see a quick poll here, um, if you could just fill in the box and describe what sort of organization you are, just so we get a sense of the audience here. Are you a network operator? Are you an enterprise with a Wi-Fi estate? Are you um, a hardware or software vendor? Are you a roaming hub or an identity provider? So we'll just give you uh, a few seconds to uh, complete that if you wouldn't mind, and then I'll tell you the results. Okay, uh, the results are in. The public has spoken. Yes, well, there we are, that's interesting. So more than 50% are from the industry side, perhaps not too surprising, hardware and software vendors. 37% of you uh, are from network operators, mobile, MSO, cable, um, but 8% from enterprise uh, companies with a Wi-Fi state, which I'm really pleased to see. Some uh, roaming hub and entity providers. So that's excellent. Thank you for completing that. We'll move on now. So uh, this may not be news to you, but I think it's worth stating. These stats come from the WBA's industry report, which comes out every autumn, every fall. Um, and as you know, the momentum for Wi-Fi is not slowing down. There are nine billion, there were nine billion devices at, uh, in um, at the end of 2019 and the way we're going there's going to be 12 billion devices with customers at the start in in 2021 of all sorts of natures for enterprise for for work purposes for entertainment for home and 80 percent of all mobile data is consumed indoors um, wi-fi carries 60 percent of all mobile data globally and uh, the growth of hotspots continues with uh, a billion over a billion by this by next year um, we carry out a survey and 90% of the respondents were already planning to deploy Wi-Fi 6 and 78% of the respondents saw that uh, the provision of extra spectrum in the 6 gigahertz band was very important or important. Lots of growing confidence in investing in Wi-Fi and an understanding that it will have a significant contribution or does have a significant contribution to the global economy to the tune of 3.5 trillion, which our friends in the Wi-Fi Alliance uh, who we collaborate with very closely um, have carried out that research. So what's it all about? Um, Wi-Fi 6 is a, is a step change, a uh, step change in technology and capability, and you will hear more about that um, soon. Um, but I think the thing to remember is it's additive, additive to previous generations. It's backward compatible. So if you're a network operator, uh, you haven't got that steep rip and replace, you can evolve 
the capability and roles of your network. And in fact, there are use cases where you could use Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 5 in the same network or same environment and have positive benefits for both because it takes the load off the Wi-Fi 5 network. It's got higher throughput, faster speed, lower latency, uh, more predictable, more deterministic uh, user experience for an operator, a bit more, if you like, carrier grade, uh, really useful in high density applications, but also uh, useful in, in IoT applications where the data itself may be not very much or not very frequent. Um, emerging use cases for augmented reality and virtual reality and autonomous robots. And if you combine it with Passpoint, Hotspot 2 and roaming, you really get the opportunity to deliver that seamless user experience across Wi-Fi and cellular. Uh, it's kind of what not to like. Um, so um, there's a lot of talk uh, about Wi-Fi and 5G uh, as being sort of competitive or, or alternatives. And I think it's really the wrong debate. For me, it's horses for courses. And for anybody who operates a network, it's about finding the best uh, quality of service at a, at a price and a cost that can be afforded by the market and by the user um, uh, at, at, at an affordable rate uh, at, at a quality level. So here you've got a chart here. It, it's, it's a bit um, detailed, I suppose, but it does show the design attributes of um, 5G, otherwise known as IMT 2020, which is the dark green, its predecessor LTE in light green, and Wi-Fi 6 in blue against a number of key attributes. And as you can see, they're complementary. Um, Wi-Fi, uh, both Wi-Fi 6 and 5G is significantly better performing than LTE, uh, but in different areas. So Wi-Fi 6, lower latency, higher traffic capacity, uh, both have similar user uh, experience data rates and connection density. Um, Cellular 5G, better on mobility, but that's, that's not a surprise, um, but also better on network efficiency. So the point is, as an operator, why wouldn't you use the best mix of these technologies in different places for different use cases to manage uh, the best user experience and manage your budgets? Uh, because it's a competitive world and users expect more and more for less as the more usage on these networks increases. Uh, a word about um, six gigahertz uh this was uh, announced and approved on the 23rd of april this year 1200 megahertz of spectrum for unlicensed use well to try and visualize what that means it's a five-fold increase in available uh spectrum for use for wi-fi and you can see versus the previous um bands available five gigahertz and 2.4 what a huge difference that is and in the chunks that's been made available it actually allows for some very significant deployments of very high usage um, use cases so in summary a step change but backward compatible got a major role to play in the 5g era wi-fi 6 is complementary uh, the release of the 6 gigahertz band will help exploit the full power of the Wi-Fi 6 functions. The economic impacts of COVID, I think, haven't played out yet, of course, but I think they will mean a rethink in how we spend, plan to spend cellular network investment, the speed with which we do that, and the how to smooth costs using alternative technologies in certain use cases, particularly indoors, deep indoors. Um, and I think that'll help um, operators gain time to market and smooth their network investment profile. So at this point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to hand over to um, my colleague and dear friend who I've known, I realised, since 2007, the first joint a a WBA meetings together um, at, the, um, at the BT Tower in London when I first met him. Uh, he's been a champion and advocate of Wi-Fi and improving the user experience consistently, major contributor to the WBA. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Nakati Kanpolat, who's a Chief Staff Architect at Intel, who's been leading the program of work in the WBA of trials to actually test this technology in, in the live. So over to you, Najati. I hope you can uh, take, uh, take control of the presentation now. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. Can you see my desktop? Uh, yes. Yes, I can. Right. 
basically, uh, I am the Wi-Fi 6 and 6C program task group chair at WBA. I'll just give you a little bit a quick insight as to what we are doing in this space and get you going for the other presenters in this without getting into too much details of what we do. Uh, now, this program has been launched about two years ago with the uh, primary goals of looking at the key capabilities of Wi-Fi 6 and what it meant for or what they meant for carriers and operators specifically for different scenarios and use cases. And uh, we, we have been working on multiple things in terms of, uh, as you are going to see, developing the white papers and uh, other uh, trials. The end goal of this, uh, the, this work is basically to understand how these technologies are relevant to key use cases that we have and properly identify how these technologies could be deployed and also providing a platform for the industry and for the participants to come and do the field trials where we can raise confidence in these new technologies so that we can just quickly ramp up the deployments all around the world and benefit from this one as quickly as possible. Now, having that in mind, basically, we first uh, looked into uh, the white paper with the enhanced Wi-Fi decoded in terms of the use cases and scenarios, how those uh, key capabilities of Wi-Fi 6 would be relevant, and published this paper about, I think, 18 months ago. Then we just moved to deployment to Wi-Fi 6 deployment guidelines under different scenarios, such as uh, what it means for uh, airports, or high density spaces like stadiums or education or enterprise IoT, we covered how the Wi Fi 6 series would be deployed properly around those scenarios. And then we have the last the understanding of the global implication of Wi Fi 6 and 6 e white paper, also uh, made it available for public as of last year. These are all available at the WBA resource site. You can download them and you just really get better ideas to what we do and how they could actually benefit you as well. Now, moving from here to actual trials that we are doing, when you look at the global map, we have really pretty good the scale and scope of those trials, going from number of them in North America, Europe, and Asia. So we try to bring pretty much everyone all around the world to get a good sense of you know, all these the trials. So WBA, in the, as we are doing these trials, basically providing a platform for anybody, for the vendors, device vendors, infrastructure vendors, operators, other uh, service providers, and et cetera, to come together and help each other, both learn and also promote, uh, you know, uh, what we can do in this space. Uh, so uh, this is pretty much, uh, uh, we develop the test cases and test plan, and connect the, all the participants and create the matrix. And then uh, you get these people set in the motion, executing the trials in the real life environment. <coughs> so we are basically coordinating communicating and helping the people or participants in this space. Now, going from here to, if you look at this table, you can see that we are covering the enterprises, airports, IoT, smart cities, educational space, all these in different verticals, quite a bit, you know, you know really scope and scale. You can see we are pretty much uh, covering all the cases possible. For Wi-Fi 6, we have about 19 uh, trials in the pipeline going on. And uh, at the same time, as so of the beginning of this year, we started looking at the Wi-Fi 6E or 6 gigahertz trials in the US and other geographies. We have about eight uh, trials or working programs in different geographies. So all in all, when you look at over here, we have 27 trials all around the world across the verticals and use cases. This is, this is really encompassing in terms of what we are doing. Pretty 
a significant uh, undertaking and uh, the delivering the service to the ecosystem and the members. Now, uh, since uh, we have other uh, speakers who are going to cover the other uh, details of the trials, I will not go through those, but I will just share only a couple of them over here to give you as the, what we are doing. For example, in uh, Korea, the SKT has basically uh, tested the Quax, uh, for Wi-Fi 6 at Quax mall. This is the largest shopping center in South Korea with 250,000 people over the weekends visiting. Now we put Wi-Fi 6 in there and then tested the capabilities, including latency throughput. Throughput, you know, we, we could easily see 800 megabit per second TCP download, which is pretty significant boost in terms of the throughput. But more interestingly, when you look at the latency with OFTMA and without OFTMA, you could see 80% reduction in latency from, uh, for example, without OFTMA, we have 21 millisecond. And with OFTMA, it comes down to four millisecond. And also uh, when you look at the throughput variation without OFTMA, it just jumps around. But with OFTMA, Wi-Fi 6 basically delivers pretty stable you know, throughput uh, and user experience across. So this is pretty interesting and eye-opening in terms of Wi-Fi 6 capabilities in high density areas, very low to, to use cases. Now, the other use case, we have AT&T with 80,000 uh, seat stadium and that they are going to replace part of the stadium with Wi-Fi 6 APs <coughs> and, they, and compare the Wi-Fi 6 capabilities with the legacy uh, Wi-Fi 5 and previous generation and get an idea as to how this thing is relevant. Unfortunately, this one right now is on hold because of uh, COVID-19. But as soon as things change, we are going to proceed with this one as well. The last uh, use case or the, the trial that I want to share over here is the cable lab trials. This is uh, covering the residential use cases for single family use case and as well as the multi-dwelling use scenarios using the real life kind of uh, downloading, watching videos, and doing, doing, making the web calls, and etc., with different types of devices, as well as mixed traffic, that we have completed the first phase of these trials, and then we are going to continue with the multi-dwelling and report it back to WBA Pro in, in a week or two with our findings. This is also very interesting in terms of covering the large segment of the populations and, and the residential space. Now, the, this is my last slide in terms of the timeline and deliverables. Uh, as you can see, we are uh, trying to wrap up the Wi-Fi 6 trials for phase one by somewhere around October and gather the uh, trial results and produce a paper or report around these trials and then share it with the industry. And then at the same time, we are ramping up on the six gigahertz uh, or six A trials, you know, starting with US and scaling to UK, Spain, Germany, you know, uh, Korea, and all other places. And I'm moving this thing till uh, March of next year because we expect that we are going to do the trials uh, on 6A with the pre-certified devices this year. And then uh, we expect that the, the certified devices will be able, available early next year and continue and wrap up the six ethers as well and produce a report around it. So uh, quite a few things going on in this space. As you can see, in terms of number of trials and then things that we are looking at, this is really mind boggling very you know, uh, exciting uh, thing that we do. So we are asking you to come and join this end-to-end real-life field trials within WBA for Wi-Fi 6 and 6E and benefit from it. So I'd like to uh, just this is my last slide and just you know, I'd like to say thank you for listening. If there is any question, one question I can take. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Sorry, just unmuting myself. Thank you, thank you, Najati. Um, and yes, uh, 
we are open we have time for questions so if you'd like to ask a question then please uh submit that in the chat uh box in the um on your screen um what you covered there najati is really a broad um range of environments which i find fascinating and uh, it just shows the flexibility of this technology you, you talked about shopping mall and uh 250,000 people at the shopping mall obviously that was pre pre-covid uh, but it must be a huge shopping mall um you talked about stadium that that will come to life but again that's another interesting use case um and then finally uh, comcast with their own uh, test home which i find fascinating but they've got their own home set up set up in denver um what do you think we're um learning from these trials and how do you think it might accelerate um the deployment of the technology and the its, its penetration in, in the market in the charting thank you for that najati are you on mute I need time. So in looking at the thing, the Wi-Fi is capable of taking from all the way IoT to high density spaces and enterprise, unlike other technologies that in the in a Wi-Fi six can deliver. So far, the trials that we have done basically has and uh, have proven that, including for example, uh, in the EU is going to start looking into Madison, what we have done over there industry for that whole iot we look at really really high density spaces i mean this is unlike any other previous technologies and this trials so over that demonstrating the strength and capabilities of uh, the uh, wi-fi 6 in the real life so and do you think this will uh, ultimately mean that the, the technology will be accelerated into into production and into into the market sooner yeah, absolutely. You know, currently, from the, the device side, for example, as Intel, we have seen significant jump in terms of the the, the demand you know, from the industry for Wi-Fi 6 devices. And, and in the deployments, we are also seeing significantly all around the world. Uh, and in this data is going to further boost the confidence in Wi-Fi 6 that uh, we are not talking about the theoretical uh, kind of scenarios this is the actual right uh, the trial taking place and that's that's the whole goal of this thing how we can just uh, make that sure that the, the this thing uh, is uh, working in the operators as well they can now make the investment and deploy this technology as quickly as possible so um uh, there is a question from the uh, from the audience, uh, Najati, um, concerning latency. Uh, what's your view on which technology performs better, uh, 5G new radio or Wi-Fi 6? Well, I don't want to get into that. But in terms of the chart that you have showed over there, from the latency point of view, they are pretty comparable, right? The, the initial spider web uh, chart that you showed in your presentation from the latency point of view it is pretty comparable but each one has its own strength its own place versus the, trying to get these technologies over there and just you know diverge so we will benefit from both of them where it you know is proper with the uh, latency number i share from the skt skt is at the same time is mobile operator in south korea for example and then they uh, clearly indi indicated that four millisecond latency in high density space with the OFDMA. This is a significant reduction compared to previous generation, which is 80% reduction in the latency. This is a huge boost for you know, Wi Fi itself, regardless of 5G. 5G. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Well, you, you may think you're, go you're going to get off lightly, but you won't because the questions come thick and fast now. Um, are there any use cases to test Wi-Fi calling as cellular mobile access network, i.e. indoor enterprise space replacing four stroke 5G small cells DAS deployments? Dot, dot, dot must be a more economic solution. So the question is, oh, are you in your program, have you got any test cases for Wi-Fi calling? 
Yes, we do have the Wi-Fi polling, board polling, in, including the residential space and enterprise spaces as well. And uh, multiple uh, segments are looking at in their mixed traffic type of thing. Yes, we have coverage that one. Okay. Um, and I'm going to um, ask you one more question. That I've got plenty here, but just one more. Were any of these Wi-Fi to Wi-Fi six upgrades? If so, are there any lessons learned? I think, if I understand it, is the equipment that we're using sort of uh, developed from Wi-Fi five, or is it sort of brand new technology? Well, one of the key learning that we did you know, that there was you no know, question because we would have the legacy devices even if you deploy Wi-Fi six networks. And I was on the call and doing making the internal presentation, and that, that question came up again. When do we really benefit from Wi-Fi six? Given that we have so many Wi-Fi five Wi-Fi four devices already available, even if we current legacy devices, we are seeing that uh, these legacy devices are benefiting from Wi-Fi six because Wi-Fi six immediately opens up the opportunity for those devices with more spectrum and uh, more space for, you know, for them to operate. So without any further you know, waiting, there is immediate you know, benefit that you, one can see with the Wi-Fi 6 with the current mixed devices, which we are testing in our environment, specifically we are not even testing Wi-Fi 6 only because the real life scenario requires that we have all these Wi-Fi 4 and Wi-Fi 5 devices also in the space. So given that we have data to show that, look, you know, you don't have to wait for all the devices to move to Wi-Fi 6 from the mobile devices, you know, ecosystem, you can benefit. Mm. Okay, Najati, thank you so much. And thanks for answering, uh, responding to those questions. Thank you for your presentation. So if we could just go back to the, um, uh, the slides now. Um, um, I'm unable to share, if you could do that, Sarah. Um, so we're going to move to our, our next um, speaker. If we could just show that, please, Sarah. No. <clears throat> okay. Um, well, whilst we're setting that up, I would like to introduce to you uh, our next speaker, who is Dr. Lee, who is um, president of a Hawaii, Huawei campus uh, network domain. You know, we've heard uh, about three very interesting use cases just now on the Wi-Fi trials, uh, shopping malls, um, stadium and, and residential. And now we're going to move in the next two uh, sessions slots to uh, a different type of domain, manufacturing industry, uh, industrial. And the first of these is with um, uh, President Lee. And I'm very pleased that he's joining us. I have to tell everybody he's joining from Beijing. Uh, so it's uh, quite late there, and I'm very uh, grateful to you, uh, Dr. Lee, for joining us. Uh, but I'd like to hand over to you and let you talk to us about the advanced uses of Wi-Fi 6 in the manufacturing industry. Okay. So can you see my uh, desktop slides? Can uh, you see yes. slides? Yes. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Okay. Oh, I will show it. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Yep, very good. Okay. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Li Xin uh, from Huawei. Uh, you can call me Ark. I am responsible for Huawei's Enterprise Campus Network product and solution. Today, I am honored to share with you about some cases of Huawei Wi-Fi 6 in industrial manufacturing scenario. As we know, industrial manufacturing scenario are totally different from uh, traditional campus scenario. They have a higher requirement on various bandwidth capacity and latency. So there are many Wi-Fi issues in bandwidth zooming latency and continuous coverage in traditional campus network. So it is possible to solve these issues by introduction Wi-Fi 6. Huawei's idea is to change the W network from best efforts delivery to high QS guarantee. So here are some cases. Yeah. Uh, Huawei itself is a manufacturing enterprise, so uh, we have a very strong demand for digital transformation of uh, manufacturing. So the biggest uh, factory of Huawei is located in Songshan Lake, near to Hong Kong. Uh, this factory 
uh, provides end-to-end -end service all the way from raw material and the semi-finished uh, product processing, uh, integrated equipment test and assembly to delivery. So Huawei's main products, such as 4G, 5G products, terminal products, and ICT equipment like the uh, switch and uh, WLAP are all manufactured there. So uh, here is some, yeah, here's this. The digital transformation of the factory uh, cons consists of uh, seven parts. Number one, IoT for access management. Uh, this, uh, the networks of the all kinds of the access of the factory reaches tens of millions US dollars. With the help of uh, wireless asset labels with the low power consumption is the FID controlled. It is expected that uh, the accepts uh, can be activated to 10% more than before. The number two, we call it cut off court. The world connections are changed to Wi-Fi connections. It could solve the problem that people frequently plug and unplug world connections. It is one more benefit that the computing resources needed for various tests are moved from the local industrial computers to the cloud. So we can realize the sharing of the computing resources and improve the reliability. Number three, uh, we call it AOI, it is uh, automated optical inspection. Uh, instead of the manual detection, AI detection time is stable, which can reduce the time fluctuation of memory detection and avoid the human interference. So there's a lot of requirements for AOI. Number four is the automatic software upgrading. Uh, the automatic equipment program is uh, loaded and switched the production parameters according to the product code. So it could reduce the program load time. Uh, it has not fixed the program uh, just for the local. So number five, it is a automated guided vehicle, AGV. Uh, we are familiar, we are, all of us are very familiar with that. So distribution of the materials uh, has been completed with AGVs, which is automatically and intelligent controlled by wireless. Number six is the PLC control. It is a program logical circuit control. Uh, this part can change the operations from the fixed mode to the flex mode. PLC control could decrease the switching time during the installation, con con transmission, and the line change. But we want all these PLC control can be controlled by the by the by the campus network, not just for the the near field control. We can control from the net. Okay, number seven is the AR VR. It can be widely used in product online maintenance areas, online remote support, night shift and other scenarios requiring experience, guidance, and assistance to reduce the downtime loss. So this is the, the seven part of it. So thanks to the digital transformation, now Huawei factory, now we can achieve a flexible manufacturing, improve equipment production efficiency, increase the production speed, implement the smart qualify detection, and enhance the product inspection processing. So of course, during this uh, digital transformation of the production lines, Huawei also encountered some network related challenges. So next, uh, I will share with you a few examples. So here is the first, for example, is about uh, uh, just how I mentioned the AOI, automated optical inspection. Um, in the past, our production line used the wide connection. At that time, the inspection, inspecting and the mirroring stations directly transmitted the photographing data to industrial uh, computers installed on the stations to complete uh, the inspection. So each station has one industrial computer and these industrial computer resources cannot be shared. We hope to combine this edge computing resource just to uh, reduce the, the, the inspection cost. In particular, our smartphone product line needs to replace the industrial computers about uh, four times a year. So each time the replacement will take eight hours and cost more than 
15 yeah, thousand US dollars for each uh, product line. So it's expensive. So we want to introduce the wireless network. We hope that the wireless network can support real-time transmission of the photographing data without the need for industry computers to perform the data compression. A typical production line has a four expecting and the mirroring stations. And uh, each station requiring about two cameras. That means a total about uh, eight cameras on a single production line. So in a single shop, in a, uh, in a workshop, there are multiple production lines. Uh, after our, our uh, calculated the required uh, uh, uplink bandwidth, we found out it's about uh, two to three giga BPS per 1,000 square meters. So it is huge for the uplink transmission. So then we have conducted many verification tests. According to the test, we find out only the highest specification Wi-Fi 6 products can be the best choice, can satisfy the requirement. It is because the Wi-Fi 6 can deliver the required network performance to meet so high density needs in uh, multiple AP and the multiple connections in a continuous coverage network scenarios. So we must consider that each AP, how the throughput in such a continuous coverage network. Okay, okay, this is the first example. The second example is about uh, the terminal auto upgrading and the testing. Uh, on the mobile terminal production line, the brushing of a mobile terminal must be upgraded at least twice. Uh, the first time is about the upgrade to the testing version in order to perform mandatory tests. And the second time is the upgrade to the official release version before factory delivery. So in the past, we used the USB copy approach to manually upgrade the terminal version. This approach had a high risk of errors. If the official release version changes before factory delivery, we need to upgrade the versions in a old USB flash drivers. So we introduce Wi-Fi to the production line. In this way, terminals can be automatically upgraded and tested through Wi-Fi. So nowadays, newly delivered terminal support Wi-Fi 6 and 160 megahertz frequency band. So we deliver Huawei's most advanced 8 by 8 MU memo Wi-Fi 6 AB. So this AP can work at 160 megahertz bandwidth to provide the faster wireless connections. To prevent interference, we also adapted a, a, sh a shielding box that just covered the, the station. So after the, the terminals automatically completed the upgrade, the related verification test can be automatically carried out in this shielding uh, box. Okay, and let's move to the, the third example. AGVs. AGVs are widely used in Huawei's factory in the warehouses. They have greatly improved the sorting and the shipment efficiencies. However, AGVs have a high requirement for the network reliability. So once uh, some network disconnection or a long network latency occurs, AGVs will stop working. So it will affect the, the working efficiency. So ensure the normal running of the AGVs we used to set the running speed of the AGV to a relatively low speed and the limit the number of AGVs to about 50 AGVs within 100 square meters. However, as the production capacity of the, uh, the, the factory increases, so more AGVs are required in the workshop and they need to run at a higher speed. All of this poses new challenges to the network. So we fully consider that the, the roaming principle of the cellular network, and then we innovatively deploy the lossless roaming yeah, functions uh, in the Wi-Fi 6. So these new uh, functions ensuring our zero packet loss when the AGV is moving. Uh, so it can be moved more fast, and the density of the AGVs also can be increased. So in this way, we can get a better working efficiency in the factory. Okay, so uh, inside the Huawei's factory, all of the IoT endpoints, such as the, the Wi-Fi enabled PLC, 
RFID material identification, asset tax, and uh, energy sensors need to need to upload data through a network. So in a typical uh, work, workshop scenarios, more than 100 and 600, 1,600 IoT endpoints need to be connected. So these IoT endpoints comply with the different IoT protocols, RFID, ZigBee, uh, such kinds of different protocols. For this reason, it is obviously unrealistic to build a dedicated network for each IoT protocols. So we build a Wi-Fi and IoT commercial network solution, especially we're using some uh, Wi-Fi AP to support the building of the external IoT car to support the IoT protocol, such as the uh, such as the Bluetooth, RFID, and ZigBee. So we combined such as the such as the UWB or the uh, asset assessment or such a, such applications together with Wi-Fi, and we're using the iMaster NCE as a deployment as a unified network management platform to provide access to a large number of IoT endpoints. So this platform can automatically identify IoT taps and the implemented the policy based control for secure admissions. So future, we want some open APS can be available to connect to third party systems. Okay, this is the uh, about the scenario. Then currently, so Huawei's automatic production line in the Songshan Lake uh, has uh, uh, produced more uh, one mobile phone uh, every 20 seconds and uh, one Wi-Fi AP every 45 seconds. Such high production efficiency achieved through the digital transformation of the product line. So uh, in particular, so wireless networks are becoming increasingly important to our factory. Any network fault uh, may affect the production. So we do what we can do to ensure the uh, 24 hours by seven days network continuity. For example, we fully explained the reliability and the redundancy assurance every uh, during uh, even during the network design. So we also use some AI algorithm to predict the network force, quickly located force, and analyzes the root causes. In doing so, we ensure everything is under control and free from the interruptions. Okay, so Wi-Fi six uh, really makes the different uh, in the industrial manufacturing. So apart from this, Wi-Fi 6 has also been proved valuable in many other sectors such as the VR teaching or smart uh, warehousing and uh, smart office spaces. So we believe that as the cloud and IoT become more popular in enterprises, Wi-Fi 6 will be used more widely than before. So uh, this is the last page. So Huawei's vision is to bring the digital to every person, home, and organizations for a fully connected, intelligent world. We will continue to work with the friends according to the entire industry to realize the vision. So let's make it happen together. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Sorry, uh, just coming off mute. Uh, really fascinating presentation there uh, with the completely different use case in 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 factories and production and um i i hope you don't mind the analogy but uh, the americans talk about uh eating your own dog food uh, perhaps drinking your own champagne and i think it's always uh, really interesting to see a, a a large company embracing the technology that it plans to uh, to sell uh, in such a comprehensive way uh is this uh deployment uh, a test for Huawei? Is it something that um, you've seen the results and now this will now become something that you will continue to use in this factory? And I'm sure you have many factories. It's something you think will be deployed across the Huawei um, company? Uh, yeah, you know that uh, because uh, we wanted to test the Wi-Fi 6 in industrial first, just uh, yeah, in Huawei's uh, uh, itself the scenario so we do a lot of tests and uh, we just uh, do some deployment for the factory and then we think this solution can be yeah, used by uh, other yeah uh, factories and uh, uh, some other uh, uh, partners can, can share with us together about this one but 
uh, of course, for the Wi-Fi 6, uh, we think about that. Uh, you know that for the Wi-Fi 6, it is uh, uh, one challenge is about uh, the, the endpoint, about the terminals. So we, we when we use the Wi-Fi 6 for our yeah, uh, manufacturing uh, factory, we found out we must uh, the deploy the Wi-Fi 6 the terminal to convert the traditional the industry some yeah wind the, the protocol to the 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 Ethernet yeah protocol and uh, the Wi-Fi 6. So it is the necessary for us to derive the Wi-Fi 6 the CPE first, and then we will convert it the connection from the wired connection to the wireless connection. So it is the challenge for that. Okay. Well, um, that, that was fascinating. And uh, as I say, quite a, quite a different use case from the ones before. I thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for, for addressing us what must be quite late in the, in the morning now, I suppose, in, in, yeah. in, in Beijing. So thank you for that. I do appreciate it. Um, and we'll now move on. So if we could just um, go there, if you could show full screen, Sarah, we seem to be seeing... Um, uh, you go full screen. Sorry, I, can't, I can't launch the poll and share my, my screen on full, so uh, we'll have to take you, I'm afraid. All right, okay. Well, we're going to our second our second poll, um, which is to, we stimulated some thoughts, some ideas here, um, and we're going to ask you, so which, how would you consider using Wi-Fi 6 from some of the things you've heard? So um, select one of the following, which might, one or more, in fact, you can set them all if you like. Um, you know, is it, would you consider using it for faster download speeds, for lower latency to enable AR or VR, or for other reasons, uh, for managing a high connection numbers in, in a high user density area, like the, um, the shopping center we, we heard uh, in Korea? Uh, is it to improve quality of service in areas with conflicting radio signals? Is it to improve the user experience with higher capacity and signal range? So if we'll give you a few seconds, if you can just pick one of those or multiple choice, you can have multiple choices uh, there. Okay, the results are coming in. The public has spoken. Okay, pretty, pretty broad uh, spread there. So top of the pops is a uh, close call between managing high number of connections of users in a high density area like the shopping mall. Um, uh, or improved user experience with high capacity and signal range. So that could be outdoor uh, for the signal range, or it could be reaching indoors from 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 uh, in a, a building with lots of uh, lots of interference or lots of um, walls and metal and glass and so forth. Uh, then comes uh, generally improving the, the quality of service with conflicting radio signals. And we know with with urban areas, this is happening more and more and more. Um, faster download speeds and lower latency. So pretty good spread. And I think that uh, illustrates the flexibility of this technology and how it can be used for different use cases. And it may well be that you'll see products in the market that are optimized to address one or other of these use cases uh, more specifically um, to, uh, to, to deliver that. So um, I think at this stage, uh, we're gonna move on, but if, um, Najati is on the, still on the audio. Are you still there, Najati? Got a question for you. We can move on. Yes, yeah, so I'm here. Yeah, the question was asked about, I think it was probably about the SKT example, uh, whether you could share uh, how many concurrent sessions were there. You had 250,000 visitors a day, I guess, um, whether there was any indication of, of the volume of, of concurrent users. I'm putting you on the spot, I know. Yeah, I need to get back to that, that question. <clears throat> That's all right. Thing. We got we got a couple of other presentations, so <laughs> yeah, That's what we find out. Okay, well, thank you, Najati. Yeah. So I did put right, on the thanks. spot. Um, we're going to stick with with in uh, enterprise and and uh, industrial, and we're going to move to um, uh, Mark Grayson, uh, who's going to talk to us about. Uh, from from Cisco, he's a distinguished consulting engineer. Um, he's a man who, in my experience, has got a, a wonderful facility of explaining complex things in a very straightforward manner. 
So I've, I've teed you up there, Mark. Um, uh, a long time contributor to the WBA um, in this area here in Wi Fi 6 and open roaming. And um, as we know, Industry 4.0 is, is the big thing in, in manufacturing. And um, I think a fantastically under known and under uh, played opportunity for Wi-Fi 6. There's a lot of talk about private 5G and, and the use of, of 5G, but actually it seems to me that Wi-Fi 6 could be even more suitable uh, in the factory situation. So, Mark, over to you. Okay, Chris, thanks for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes great stuff. So, um, yeah, great introduction. But I'm, I'm just a warm-up guy for, for Dave, uh, Dave Green from Metis, who's going to follow me. But I just wanted to uh, do a little bit of scene setting, I guess, from a, a, a use case of Wi-Fi 6 in the factory. So, so some scene, set, scene setting before we get into the details. And, and I guess, you know, the, the mega trend here is around machine-to-machine -machine, uh, left-hand side. So this is some data from um, Cisco uh, annual internet report. Um, so left hand side looking at the number of devices and we can see a 10% KGO in terms of number of devices. Drilling down on that blue uh, item uh, on the right hand side, that's looking at the global growth of machine to machine sort of Internet of Things connections. And we can see there that we've got uh, a compound annual growth of 19%. Um, of IoT. So quite clearly we're seeing a transition where in the past I would say we've built networks predominantly for smartphones. I think this is indicating in the future we're going to be building networks for things. Um, another couple of data points is uh, around 5G. Yes, 5G is going to be around. Great question on, on 5G latency. But all the reports are saying that, that even by 2025 we're, we're still going to be sub 20, 25% of all connections on 5G. So still the analysis is saying the majority of IoT connections are gonna be going over Wi-Fi. Okay, so we're all sitting at home, I guess, in the, in the current climate in a consumer IoT environment. You know, we've got Wi-Fi enabled TVs, uh, light bulbs, plugs, white goods, so we can see that already Wi-Fi is, is pervasive in terms of the consumer IoT environment. Switching to, to enterprise, uh, then we also see Wi-Fi being used for IoT use cases already uh, within the enterprise environment. And, and I was just looking back to one of the WBA awards that Cisco won back in 2018, and it was a joint uh, submission with uh, the University of British Columbia and Sensible Building Services, and they were using the Wi-Fi network to get analytics about how people moved around the buildings, and they linked that closed loop with their heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, and were predicted to save between two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars a year by using their Wi-Fi network in terms of integrating that into an overall IoT offering. So already Wi-Fi is being used within uh, enterprise. Double click on the next option uh, in terms of industrial IoT. I guess now the question is how far it can reach. We heard from Dr. Lee uh, looking at a manufacturing use case. I guess the key about industrial is it's not a one size fits all. It's very much vertical specific. So the requirements of supply chain logistics very different from those of natural resources, power utilities, etc. But we're just going to drill down a little bit on industrial IoT. And if you are looking to support industrial IoT, you know, in the past, you would use, um, you know, uh, Ethernet IP type service, common industrial protocol type approaches uh, using fixed infrastructure. That gives us visibility of the requirements that we see with the industrial IoT uh, uh, environments. And here we can see the range of different latencies and throughputs. And really we see the, the real strict latencies only being required for specific use cases. 
So those are the, the pick and place machines, the multi-access uh, motion systems, the, the high-speed printing presses. They need latency sub one millisecond. Often they will be changing 60 axes in under one millisecond, and therefore they require something of a nanosecond type, 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 type accuracy. But as we move out of that particular environment into logistics distribution, we can see the latency increasing, we can see the throughput increasing, and obviously the, the uh, ability of Wi-Fi to address you know, a larger range of those use cases that we get with, with obviously the benefit of Wi-Fi 6. So it's not a one-size-fits-all from industrial IoT, very much use case specific. And final slide about uh, Wi-Fi 6, absolutely it's going to deliver enhanced capabilities to address those IoT requirements. And, and, and one takeaway is really it's about increased predictability. What we suffered from, from early generations of Wi-Fi was, was the predictability of performance once we started loading networks. These are some data points taken from a particular uh, implementation of Wi-Fi 6. Comparing Wi-Fi 6 when we haven't enabled the scheduler to when we have uh, uh, enabled the OFDMA scheduler, we can see we get higher data rates, but we haven't got the higher data rates by just cherry picking the, the users close to the access point. We're able to decrease the standard deviation of, of throughput between the clients, which means that everyone is now getting a more predictable level of service using the Wi-Fi infrastructure. And of course, latency is reduced. And in this particular implementation, when we turned on the scheduler, we were getting about a 35% decrease in the maximum round trip delay, uh, according to, to the, the particular setup we have. So key takeaway is that yes, uh, industrial IoT, it's very much use case specific in terms of requirements, but look what we're getting with Wi-Fi, a whole new set of enhanced capabilities in order to better address those IoT requirements. So as I said, this was this was the warm-up guide to Dave, but uh, I guess maybe we've got time for a couple of questions. Chris, as I hand it back to you. Yep, okay, we, we are, um, we've had so many questions that uh, we are um, probably a bit pushed for time, but I will ask you uh, a, a question. Um, um, in fact, just going back to that last slide, what, what I still find um, uh, amazing with, with, with Wi-Fi 6 is how it is addressing so many different attributes at the same time without appearing to have a degradation. You know, you talked about 5% higher data rate, 30% uh, reduction in standard deviation and 30%, 35% reduction in latency. Um, do you think... Um, you're going to end up with one bit of kit that will do all these things or will you have kind of um, types of five um, Wi-Fi 6 equipment that will be optimized to a certain use case? Yeah, so I think I think we're going to see a single set of equipment, but but really the differentiation now and, and the, the extra axes of, of, of configuration is in the scheduler. And we know we can configure the scheduler to address various different requirements. So, so it could be to increase aggregate throughput if that's the scenario you want. Obviously, we're talking about industrial here, which we think about determinism and production so uh, and predictability. So you may be having a particular scheduler for a specific use case, but I think it's the same equipment. It's just how you then configure that equipment. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark, and thanks once again for a great presentation as ever. And as you say, you are but the warm-up act to uh, uh, our, our customer here today, Dave Green, who's IT Director of Metis Aerospace. I'm so pleased that we've got uh, Dave joining us. He's been a contributor and collaborator with us on this journey on uh, Wi-Fi 6. So um, without further ado, Dave, I want to hand over to you to um, share with you your experiences uh, at Metis. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Okay, so I'll, uh, I'm excited. So I'm uh, Dave Green, in charge of IT here at Metis Aerospace. Uh, we are a designer, uh, manufacturer of precision forged, machined, and subassembled components, primarily for the aerospace and defense industry. Um, we've got a large site, it's around 27 acres, uh, currently got around 540 employees, around 3,600 assets, 
60 of those are um, heavy uh, mechanical presses. So our site is, uh, is very varied. Um, we've got machines dating back to sort of the 1940s, uh, sort of the war era, going right the way up to state-of-the-art five-axis machines. Um, the fabric of the buildings is predominantly uh, steel and, uh, and heavy ironworks. Um, and then within the facility is a lot of, of, of heavy metal machinery. And on top of that, we have um, metal stillages which contain our work, which is typically um, titanium. And, uh, and, and these present their own challenge in that these stillages will be stacked sort of five high um, at some points during the day. Um, and then at other points during the day, they, they will be absent completely, which all these things added together um, present a, a quite a challenging environment for a, a, a Wi-Fi deployment. So why do we want Wi-Fi? Well, we need to get all our assets talking regardless of their age. Um, and, and once we've done that, we're, we're, we're going to have a, a real step change in, uh, in, in the digital factory. So we want to enable sort of walk by health checks for our maintenance department. Um, we want to enable predictive maintenance rather than fix on failure. We want to give our maintenance department the ability to use virtual reality, um, video standard operating procedures. Um, we want to put sensors everywhere. So we anticipate that we're going to need around 20,000 sensors to cover the entire site. And they will be monitoring things like vibration, rotation, pressure, liquid levels, power, and, and other things as well. Collecting all this data and putting it into a central repository will then enable us to do things like um, a golden batch methodology. Now, golden batch is where we, we take the readings from the best product that's gone through, um, bearing in mind that you know, the, the forging um, process has inherent variability because we're changing the shape of metal. And it's all about reducing that variability. So if we capture the best product that's gone through, we can then use that to measure all future product that goes through. And we can start putting in alarms and even hard stops on machines when we can see that they're not set up to give the optimum results. What this will do is it, it will reduce scrap, it will reduce the amount of rework that's required on the product, and ultimately that will increase throughput. So you can see we're, we're touching on every area here from the maintenance of the kit, to, to increasing throughput, um, to increasing um, reliability and, and visibility throughout the entire site. So we engaged with the WBA last year um, to, to put in a trial of, of uh, Wi-Fi 6. We have tried putting Wi-Fi within the factory before um, and we haven't had very good re results. Um, so we thought Wi-Fi 6 um, with, with all the, the, the new capabilities, um, now is the time to, to, to give it another go. Um, so it consisted of, um, of three phases. The first phase consisted of getting the, uh, the equipment installed. We identified a target Wi-Fi area, um, which was sort of three bays within the manufacturing facility. And with the help of um, Ivy Wave, they did a site survey um, and analysis to, to determine the optimum locations for um, the access points. And then together with Broadcom, Intel and Cisco, uh, we got uh, all the equipment um, installed and, uh, and up and running. So we started off with 11 live access points installed um, in the bays. Um, we found that this gave good coverage across the target Wi-Fi area. And the, the results were, were surprisingly good, I have to say. Um, we got speeds of, of 700 megabits per second using the 80 megahertz channel, very low latency. Um, and in fact, all the trials that we that we we did um, happened flawlessly. So we, we tried a little bit of mixed reality. Um, we did some uh, video calling. Uh, we did um, high throughput and large file transfer, um, and we, we didn't find a, a hitch with with any of it. And it really did exceed our expectations, especially seeing the the the, the poor experience that we that we had had before. Um, so that really was very encouraging for us. So we're just starting on the, the phase two now. So the phase two is more about real world testing. Um, so we're going to be doing sustained throughput. 
where we're transferring um, large files um, over an extended period of time. Um, and also, um, we do have um, susceptibility to power cuts here, so we want to see how um, Wi-Fi 6 recovers from, from power cuts. Uh, we want to do mixed environment using uh, Wi-Fi 5 as well um, to make sure everything plays nicely together. Uh, we want to test the, the new functionality of target wait time within Wi-Fi 6, and we also want to do some, some additional technical testing as well. And then phase three of that is, is along the, the Wi-Fi 6E, so the 6 gigahertz. So we have just been granted by Ofcom the license to do uh, proof of concept trials, uh, which I believe is, is one of the first outside the USA. Um, we're, we're just finalizing the, the plans for that right now, um, but we do want to make sure that augmented reality um, is going to feature quite heavy, heavily in the, uh, in the first phase of, of the, uh, the 6 gigahertz testing as well. So that's me today. Um, so I hope you found that useful and uh, open to any questions. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Dave. Always, always useful to hear a real life example put into context in a, in a business context. Um, I'd never really considered the notion of golden batches and continually benchmarking your, your, your best output. Uh, I suppose it, it, it makes sense, um, but I never really considered that. And you talked of tens of thousands of, of sensors or things to be sensed, which I think is uh, really interesting. You think about the scale of this thing. Um, I'm going to ask you a question you probably can't answer or may not want to answer yet, but the preventative maintenance side of things, um, you know, have you got any notion of, of what that could um, save uh, your company in terms of, of downtime, prevented downtime, or or costs of of, of uh, avoiding um, avoiding um, uh, problems with your machinery that you you prevented uh, because you're not doing things in a rush. Have you had any notions around that? Well, currently um, we we operate twenty four seven. So if we if we have a piece of equipment that's that's failed, um, then you know production stops. If we've got um, vibration sensors, for example, they will they will be able to detect that a bearing is wearing out long before an operator notices a problem or there's a degradation in in uh, product quality. So we can we can then use that data to to schedule downtime in quieter production um, areas or time slots, um, so that we can we can do it in a in a more controlled fashion. Um, in terms of our cost, I, I haven't got figures right now in terms of the, the cost, but you know, the amount of time that we will be able to, to save um, is, is going to be pretty significant. And being able to, to know beforehand that, that a machine is, is uh, uh, you know, degrading in, in performance is going to be a, a massive benefit to us. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dave. We've had some questions in uh, across a number of uh, the, the uh, topics, not, not just this one, but one that I think is is uh, apposite. And, and maybe I'll ask this of, of, of Mark, if, I can't see on the video, but probably on the on the audio. Um, I've got a question here for for Wi-Fi six IoT scenarios. Sensors also need to support Wi-Fi six. Is that correct? Uh, yes, they do. And uh, I guess uh, Dave can talk about the availability of sensors. And I think that's that was one of the uh, I guess uh, findings I guess of the early stages is that you know we do need those Wi-Fi six enabled endpoints to obviously benefit from that. But I think even yesterday we we heard um, I think it was it from Broadcom that was saying that even um, with sort of a mixed environment you could re receive benefits. But I think the true benefits do come with Wi-Fi six enabled endpoints. When you say mix, you mean from Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 6? Correct. Yeah, yeah. And um, the other question that's come in is, is Wi-Fi 6 and, and Wi-Fi 5 coexistence was, you know, um, how, how does that work? Do you need to upgrade all your Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6 or can you have a mixed environment? Can you comment any further, elaborate any further on, on what was said yesterday or from your experience? Yeah, I mean, that's the benefit of Wi-Fi, isn't it? I mean, if we were talking about LTE to 5G, we'd have to sort of rip and replace. We know a 5G radio doesn't support LTE, whereas that Wi-Fi 6 radio is supporting Wi-Fi 5, 4, and previous generations. I think that's the key in terms of investment protection 
that you can be then guaranteed the ability to support those devices for the future. Okay, well, look, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I, I find industrial IoT actually the most exciting. I know I probably should be excited by the consumer side of things, but um, I, can, I personally can see how the, um, the quantifiable business cases can be developed to show improvements in preventative maintenance and in other services in, a, in an environment that you've described, but also in, in the previous speaker from uh, Huawei, clear um, <clears throat> advantages in, in, in providing a, a wirelessly connected solution and Wi-Fi 6 appears to um, meet that well. So I'd just like to say a big thank you, Dave, for joining us today and contributing to the WBA program uh, and for you, Mark. Um, I may, I may yet have more questions for you, so don't go away, Mark. Um, now, on to our next speaker, um, another man who's well known to the WBA, been a huge contributor over the years, uh, Kishore Raja, he's the Vice President of Engineering Research and Development in Boingo, uh, bags of experience in this space. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Kishore, who's going to talk about uh, Boingo's experience in, in high density environments, at stadiums, airports, um, and transportation. So over to you, Kishore. Thank you, Chris. Hello, everybody. Can you guys uh, see my screen? And I'm hoping you can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up if, if you can. Yes, we can. All right, thank you. So as Chris mentioned, my name is uh, Kishore Raja. I'm the Vice President of uh, Engineering Strategy at Boingo Wireless, as well as I'm the Next Generation Workgroup Chair at WBA. I've been with the company for about 13 years now, and probably close to 10 years with uh, WBA. You know, we started our active participation, you know, back in the days when uh, Wi-Fi was still uh, very early. And so I'm going to be talking about uh, the use of Wi-Fi 6 in busy commercial venues like airports and stadiums and transportation hubs. We have a couple of trials, so I'm going to pull up some data from one of the trials that we did so you can understand how Wi-Fi 6 is performing in a practical live scenario. All right, a little bit about Boingo. Probably most of you know who we are. You know, we are a neutral host wireless service provider. We serve more than 1 billion consumers annually. We have close to 40,000 DAS nodes, more than 100,000 Wi-Fi access points, 55 plus uh, military bases. You know, we have close to 200 uh, multifamily and single family units that we serve. And uh, in total, I think we serve more than 2,000 buildings. And we obviously deploy uh, DAS, small cells, Wi-Fi, any uh, wireless technology that will help um, uh, solve a connectivity problem in uh, busy commercial venues. Okay, so that's these. This is the highlight again. So these are all the venues where uh, Boingo has been predominantly involved, solving the connectivity and the capacity problems. So I'm on the technology and the R&D side, but I I do get a chance to take some of these technologies and apply how they can be used in a real world commercial scenario. So, you know, it's one thing to have a, a really nice technology like Wi-Fi 6, but you really need to find a practical use case. You know, Wi-Fi 6 supports so many features. You, have, you heard all the speakers starting from Chris talk about the various features of Wi-Fi 6. I'm not gonna go down the list, but I'll tell you how we are actually using each of these features to solve the, the challenges as well as create new models in commercial buildings. So one last slide about Boingo. Uh, we uh, strongly uh, support in neutral host uh, deployment, as I mentioned uh, to start with, which means anything in uh, uh, upcoming technologies in Wi-Fi, DAS and small cells, CBRS uh, predominantly in US uh, since when FCC announced about 150 megahertz of uh, spectrum uh, there's a whole bunch of neutral host opportunities uh, that we have been exploring and uh, deploying over there. And of course, last but, last but not the least is the millimeter wave. So what's the vision for a commercial connected uh, future? Number one, make sure that you have uh, coverage as much as possible. Can we do 100% coverage? Obviously, it's not possible. So have better coverage, more throughput and capacity, most of you know the demand for capacity is rising more than ever. So hopefully with technologies like Wi-Fi 6, again, I'll show you in some of the subsequent slides, how does uh, Wi-Fi 6 solve some of the capacity problems? Reduce latency. You know, a network is as good as um, the, um, 
the information that can be delivered to the user as soon as possible, right? So that's very key, be it Wi-Fi or licensed networks. And then of course, a low cost. Uh, it's very important to have a, a smaller TCO, um, uh, excuse me, a lower cost of uh, ownership and uh, a higher uh, uh, you know, uh, results from the uh, deployment uh, going forward. And this is of course across the spectrum, whether it's licensed, unlicensed or shared license spectrum. Obviously, I'm going to focus this presentation on unlicensed for Wi-Fi 6. All right, so let's jump into the action. What exactly is uh, Wi-Fi 6 and how does it uh, um, dwell in a live commercial scenario? So one of our main goals, as I mentioned before, is uh, we have about um, um, you know several hundred thousand customers uh, walking through the airports and transportation hubs uh, you know, every single year. Our goal is to make sure that how do we make the networks faster, smarter, and more efficient. So I'm going to uh, touch upon each of this topic. Why faster? Because of the obvious demand and uh, capacity, right? So networks have to be uh, faster. Now, why smarter? The end user devices, your tablets and smartphones and all kinds of devices that users uh, use these days are getting smarter and smarter. They have multiple radios. They have the radio access technologies uh, aggregating in them. Um, so the devices are getting really smarter, which means the networks to which the devices connect also should get smarter. So that's very key, meaning not always serving the, the maximum capacity. You have to burst at times and you have to go down based on the traffic available. So we use uh, some of those bursting uh, technologies uh, and processes within our venues. And obviously we want to make sure that the Efficiency of the network uh, is something that we uh, give more importance to, right? So it's not possible to serve all the customers at 100% capacity, but the goal is to see how efficient can we make the entire deployment, be it Wi-Fi 6 or otherwise. Okay, so how exactly uh, do we take technologies like Wi-Fi 6 into a commercial venue? Number one, we start in the, the Boingo R&D lab. We work with several uh, vendors, including you know, some of them, Cisco is on, on the call as well. So we work with the vendors, infrastructure vendors, device vendors, uh, as well as software vendors. And we spend quite a bit amount of uh, trials in the lab. We also have lab to lab uh, coordination. And then we pick uh, one of the commercial venues. In this case, we did pick a John Wayne Airport. This was back in 2019. And by the way, we were the first to have a commercial Wi-Fi 6 trial deployment, like with others, you know, commercial first CBRS deployment, uh, as well as DAS and other technologies. And then we partnered with the airport to see what, what is the use case that they're working on, and we put them in a trial scenario, obviously not in a, a full commercial scenario. So then we run through those uh, use cases with them and understand how the network is performing before we actually flip on the switch to our commercial users, right? That obviously gets closer to the concept of convergence. I talked about having Wi-Fi or CBRS or DAS. So the more and more we understand each of these technologies, when we deploy them in the venues, when you have a combination of Wi-Fi 6 and small cells and CBRS and DAS, it's completely a different behavior than when you just deploy Wi-Fi 6 in a greenfield venue. So once we deployed at the John Wayne Airport, I mean, we got tremendous uh, feedback uh, from the airport director, from some of our customers, you know, some key stats from the airport, roughly about 10 million uh, passengers go through annually at John Wayne uh, Airport. So Wi-Fi 6 was initially deployed in the administration building, not in the main part of the, uh, the building. And we had several staff members as part of the trial using Wi-Fi 6 for the day-to-day -day activities. So they had, early Wi-Fi 6 devices back in 2019 and all their activities, including their business and work activities running on Wi-Fi 6 network, um, getting the high efficiency uh, data rates and ultra fast uh, speeds. Now, let's, um, before we I move on to the results, what's the, the value proposition? Uh, again, I don't want to get into too many, um, uh, too much of uh, uh, the feature discussion, but from a very high level perspective, efficiency is what we're looking at. When we have, several million passengers going through the airport and connecting at Wi-Fi, we want to make sure that we uh, adopt a technology that provides us efficiency. Throughput is obvious and uh, capacity and robustness is, is um, you know, given. All right, so here's a early preview of the practical Wi-Fi 6 results. So 
before I discuss about this, I'm going to spend maybe about a minute talking about this. Then I just have only one slide before I uh, wrap up. So I'm going to give you the scenario as to how, what all elements uh, you have to take into consideration when you look at a, um, a practical latency or packet loss or throughput. You first have the access point, the first node on which the devices connect to. Then you have a controller. Then you have a gateway. Then you have a router. Then you have uh, your backhaul circuit. Now the circuit can have all kinds of characteristics. There could be bursting available in the circuit. You could have something like one gig circuit that could burst up to 10 gig based on certain parameters. And obviously, you know, you'll not have the bursting uh, available always, right? So I'm gonna pick two examples. So we ran TCP tests in the downlink and uplink on 80 megahertz Wi-Fi 6 channel, as well as 160 megahertz. Now look at the the, the right two uh, columns. It's Wi-Fi 6 estimated data and Wi-Fi 5. So as you can see, straight out of the box without making any infrastructure advancements, I'm talking about existing infrastructure. The circuit is still the same circuit we've been using. We haven't upgraded to 10 gig circuit. We can see a straight 60% efficiency, at least 50% comfortably between Wi-Fi 5 and Wi-Fi 6. And I'm only talking about the air efficiency, right? I'm not talking about anything else that goes on the wire, what happens on the internet circuit perspective. Straight when you switch from Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6, this is the efficiency you're getting on a given 80 megahertz channel. We could not do a comparison on the 160 megahertz channel. It's because obviously we never had 160 megahertz uh, devices available yet. This takes into consideration a lot of things, modulation and coding scheme. You can read about this here. The slides will be shared. And, and the last point here is we are only taking 55 to 70% uh, efficiency of the overall uh, throughput. And the reason is given the busy commercial environment, not the lab environment. You have so many people, so many devices. We only assume that a maximum of 70% of that data throughputs can be used. So last slide I have is, uh, you know, Chris already talked about this one, so I'm not going to uh, mention too much time. Wi-Fi 6 is very well positioned to satisfy IMT 2020 requirements and heading towards 5G convergence. This is a very well suited uh, technology for uh, practical commercial uh, deployments. And the last slide I have is in the era of convergence, especially in indoor buildings, unlike, you know, outdoor spaces where you have 200 foot macro towers, Indoor is a completely different beast. You have all of these technologies that have to play well together. Wi-Fi 6, you know, millimeter wave, LoRa, 5G, pass point on, on the legacy Wi-Fi technologies. When you put all of them together, that's where you see the benefit and you really have to make sure that they play well against each other and not just by themselves. That pretty much should end my presentation. Thank you very much and I'm open to any questions now. Great, thank you, Keyshaw. Um, very informational as, as ever, uh, with real hands-on experience in what is quite an interesting environment, airports, travel hubs, um, stadiums. You've got those peaks of users all of a sudden, and you've, as you said, you've got very busy radio environments with all kinds of technologies in there. Uh, and, I, and I completely concur with your philosophy, the Bingo, Boingo philosophy, that this is about convergence, it's not about one or the other um so i'm just going to ask you one question that i have here you know how do you see wi-fi fitting in in that mixed environment as opposed to <clears throat> kind of standalone yeah that's a good question uh, chris uh, as you know and as i mentioned in my presentation slides most of our venues with exception of very few have more than wi-fi wi-fi dies and small cells so when we deploy this uh, technologies one of the things that we do is we look at the use cases let me give you one example, right? So a common use case for Wi-Fi is when devices go and attach to a Wi-Fi network, let's say automatically using Passpoint, the applications on the device wake up automatically, unlike on a DAS or a small cell. So your email client, uh, your, you know, IM and, you know, chats and, you know, other type of applications will start automatically syncing 
um, and so the data usage starts to go higher. So what we do in a busy environment is we use this bursting um, technology and process where we have, we allow the Wi-Fi clients to automatically burst to the maximum peak capacity, whatever that maximum is, one gig or 10 gig circuit, we make sure the application download the content and then bring the bursting back uh, lower. So this way they can use the spectrum as quickly and efficiently and as much as possible. And then once it comes back down, every other user can start using without them being prolonged for a longer time. Mm. Brilliant. Well, there's, no, there's nothing like real life experience of managing these different technologies in, in what are very busy environments. But uh, thank, thank you so much, Keyshaw, for sharing your experience. Um, if I've still got Dave and or Mark uh, available, uh, there's a question that I, I, I didn't see until after we, we've moved on. But if, if you're there, um, slightly different angle, which was um, what is it that Wi-Fi 6 was able to deliver for Metis that uh, LTE could not have done? Is, uh, are you there, Mark or Dave, or have we lost you? Mark, I can yeah, see so you. I'm, I, I'm still here. I don't know if Dave's yeah, on. I'm still here as well, yeah. Yeah, Dave, do you want to take that, I guess, just in terms of uh, spectrum deployment ownership control? Oh. I think that I think that, that that both have their place in terms of of sort of LTE and and Wi-Fi, but we do have we do have a number of um, legacy Wi-Fi um, devices as well that we use in the in the offices, such as you know laptops and various other things, and we wanted to be able to to free those from the office as well. So it just made sense to us that extending Wi-Fi out onto the shop floor um, was the most logical explanation, logical approach at this time. We also, um, being a sort of an aerospace and a defence company, we have to make sure that our, our data is protected. Um, so we need to make sure that the data is contained within Metis. And, and again, Wi-Fi seems the easiest route at the moment to to achieve that. Yeah, Dave, I'll just add. So, so I mean, LTE's benefit is when you're in exclusive spectrum, you can go high power. But if you look at the Metis environment that that they described, we've got moving metal, and and we've got copious amounts of reflections and so so when we configured the network we effectively had to turn the power right down because we wanted to avoid you know repeated reflections and and, and as Dave described the RF characteristics in the morning with those hoppers in place was very different when when the hoppers got moved so we were talking about a very dynamic RF environment which we thought didn't necessarily showcase what LTE had where you know the benefit there is really around the longer range that you get from uh, operating LTE. So I think when we look at the environment, we see you know really hostile. That's even before you get to the, is it the graphite grease that you use and seems to coat everything within the foundry. And and so uh, you know as Dave said, the performance from Wi-Fi uh, certainly exceeded uh, all our expectations. Okay, well, lesson there is watch out for moving hoppers and graphite grease. Um, <laughs> uh, Keyshaw, we just got a question just come in um, before we move on. Um, does Wi-Fi 6 give Boingo more control over this bursting uh, technique? I, I think it doesn't necessarily give more control on the uh, bursting. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's mostly on the air interface side. So bursting happens on the on the circuit. Right, so there's certain amount of capacity you use on the circuit. So when we have more and more um, Wi-Fi devices uh, getting connected, especially when you have a you know Airbus 380 coming out of a uh, 300 to 500 people walking out of uh, Airbus 380 when the airplane lands, we have this you know swath of people walking in. That's when we want to make sure these people get the maximum circuit capacity. So I don't think Wi-Fi 6 necessarily helps over there, but I think where Wi-Fi 6 really helps is you know, we have 80 to 90% capacity on all the access point we use in the uh, the venue. Most people don't get to talk about it. That is where Wi-Fi 6 helps. You know, when you, let's say that you have an AP with 200 people as a capacity, when you have like 150 or 160 people connected, they get the same latency. They get the same throughput on Wi-Fi 6, which was never the case in Wi-Fi 5. No, no. That is that's a that's a huge step change in itself. Um, I'm going to move on, gents, in the interest of time, and move to our next speaker. Um, so if we can just show that. So this is uh, 
uh, Irvin Guy, who's the Vice President of Marketing at On Semiconductor. Uh, Irvin, uh, I can see you there. Um, I'm going to hand over to you because you're going to tell us about a practical deployment for, for Wi-Fi 6E, which is the uh, the use of the 6 gigahertz band. So over to you. Thank you for joining us. Can't can't hear you, Irvin. You may be on mute. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, great. So thank you, Chris. Uh, Erwin Guy with On Semiconductor. I'm going to talk about four key points. Uh, one, the benefits of 6 gigahertz. Uh, of course, the trade-offs uh, that we have to consider as we start deploying these products, given some of the propagation characteristics. And then also, third, the product types uh, that we see coming to market first, perhaps as early as uh, holiday season this year in retail, uh, and then uh, more of them in uh, Q1 of next year and some of the deployment scenarios uh, that we see uh, happening in the market. So if you just take a look at uh, where we've come from, uh, I think Ashore talked about this a little bit also uh, in terms of the performance lift. Even if you don't do a whole lot, just going from Wi-Fi 1 over to uh, Wi-Fi 6, you have reached 11 megabits per second to 9.6 gigabits per second. And for many consumers uh, at the end of the day, all they know is what it means in terms of practicality. So if you were downloading a movie, it might have taken you like an hour or something on Wi-Fi 1, and now you can do it in a matter of seconds on Wi-Fi 6. And this is even before uh, 6 gigahertz deployments. So there's a real uh, life benefit, uh, not only in Industry 4.0 or in uh, different scenarios, but very practically from a consumer standpoint in how many of us are using uh, connectivity at home, especially in the today's environment. And if you take a look at what happened in April from uh, the FCC and the JITPI's announcement, really it's the biggest uh, spectrum availability that we've had 1.2 in the US market, uh, 6 gigahertz. And as Europe starts moving in this direction, that would be another 500 megahertz of new spectrum. More important than that, I think uh, it's the number of channels in 160 megahertz that have become available. I think uh, one of the previous speakers talked about uh, in Wi Fi 5, uh, they did not test uh, in 160 because the products were not available. In many cases, uh, the silicon was available and it supported 160, but given the fact that 5 megahertz only had 260 megahertz channels, it was not very practical to deploy that. So with 6 gigahertz, in addition to the fact uh, that it builds up on OFDMA, multi-user MIMO features, uh, the fact that you're getting uh, 14 80 megahertz additional channels, 7 additional 160 megahertz channels uh, compared to 5 gigahertz, it really means a lot more practical deployments will become real. Uh, I think one of the uh, folks talked about enterprise deployments. In enterprise, uh, many of the Wi-Fi 5 deployments were still leveraging 40 uh, megahertz channels. They were not actually using even the 680 megahertz channels because they wanted to swap out. With uh, the fact that with 6 gigahertz, you have 760, uh, you have so many 80 megahertz channels, it just means the overall performance of the networks uh, will go up even without making too many other changes uh, other than uh, Wi-Fi 6 and 6C uh, silicon products. The other benefit, of course, is the fact that you have less congestion. Uh, if the devices are supporting 6 gigahertz, you will avoid 2.4 and 5. I'll talk a little bit about how we can do steering uh, between the different bands from a deployment standpoint. And also with less contention uh, and more channels, uh, you'll have lower latency. And when some of the uh, use cases are dealing with IoT, given the fact that you can have those smaller channels, lower latency means it will also lead to better battery life, which will again increase the IoT deployments that this technology and this standard actually enables. However, in addition to the benefits, uh, obviously there are trade-offs. Uh, I think uh, we looked at those a uh, little bit in terms of propagation delays. While you might have that 1.2 uh, gigahertz of extra spectrum uh, and those extra 160 channels, if you just take a look at a side-by-side -side comparison of five versus six, uh, you know, with a similar transmit power, uh, you do have more loss if you go through one brick wall, like many of our uh, European homes uh, or uh, Asian homes, uh, you will have a bigger loss. 
If you go through a typical US home uh, with the drywalls, again, if four drywall loss is significantly higher compared to what you would have in five, uh, the free space loss is higher as well. So if you just take a look at the total RSSI you will get at the receiver, you have roughly about 6.4 uh, dB of extra loss. So that is something, uh, you know, as we are creating solutions, we're paying attention to so that when the customer starts rolling out the product, it's not just the number uh, of the spectrum or the bandwidth, uh, 9.6, for example, but how do you actually realize that? And that might mean higher MIMO products. It might mean uh, you deploy more mesh nodes uh, to create that uh, uh, capacity and the resiliency of the network. All that needs to be taken into account. This chart kind of gives you uh, what we see would be a typical uh, uh, rollout model. When I say that we expect products uh, start rolling out uh, towards the holiday season uh, in the Western market, and probably the, uh, in uh, addition, it will be products that complement the broadband gateways. You could actually have a product that you uh, use for bridging uh, that could replace ethernet or coax uh, to connect up with either your pawn or with your cable gateways you would have uh, solutions that have mesh nodes. You can support the legacy 2.45 uh, clients, but at the same time, you would have the tri-band solution to support six gigahertz clients. And then of course, uh, we expect the clients to start rolling out uh, uh, really in 2021 from a flagship mobile phone and those type of applications. So the ecosystem is really starting to build probably much more aggressively than we've seen uh, in previous transitions uh, in Wi-Fi. From an on standpoint, uh, in the public domain, we've already announced three products that we're sampling to our customers. And when we do that, that means, uh, you know, customers in some cases have uh, kicked off or are kicking off designs uh, on those technologies. One of the things that we're focused on is, just if you take a look back historically, uh, the infrastructure products in Wi-Fi always tend to build out much faster uh, or earlier than the client products. And there's a reason for that. When the clients roll out, it's usually uh, with a flagship phone launch and in one weekend, you're gonna ship millions of those units and those clients will be out there. And this will probably be the same for six gigahertz. We saw that with multi-user MIMO clients as well. However, on the infrastructure, there's no one switch that you can turn on uh, that will you know, lay out the network. So it takes much longer to build out in retail, in enterprise, from a service provider standpoint. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is how do we make sure when folks are deploying those uh, uh, new gateways or routers or access points, they don't have to worry about the fact that the clients are not there in majority yet. So we have an adaptive approach which allows uh, the technology to have uh, some streams act as five gigahertz, some as six gigahertz, uh, and some as 2.4. However, till the six gigahertz clients are in majority, all those streams can be bundled together to support five gigahertz. In some case, upper five band or lower five band, but five gigahertz. And then as the clients roll out in six, it can be a, a software upgraded or just adjusted uh, from the same hardware to support uh, dedicated bands. And the reason we did this is it actually starts deploying uh, the six gigahertz infrastructure much faster. Uh, the service providers or the enterprise guys don't have to worry, okay, will I be making a uh, CapEx investment that kind of sits dead uh, for two to three years till the majority of the clients are six. So this helps uh, get the market moving ahead of the curve. The second design, of course, is a pure tri-band where you have dedicated streams for 2.4, 5, and 6. And then the third product at the bottom of the chart just kind of shows you how you will have mesh nodes uh, that support uh, the products as well. Uh, you might have gateways and then you might have a sprinkling of mesh nodes in a lighter MIMO configuration that complements that network. So as we start deploying those products, some of the considerations that we take into account uh, like I mentioned, the six gigahertz clients will probably not be in a majority out there, even if a flagship uh, phone launch happens early next year. Uh, it'll probably take two to three years to cross over to that point. Uh, you probably want to deploy Wi-Fi 60 solutions that are more flexible. So the biggest uh, 
uh, traction we're getting from our customers is backhaul solutions right now, Wi-Fi 6 backhaul solutions, mesh node solutions, and then of course the adaptive solution where the 6 uh, MIMO order can still support 5 uh, gigahertz clients till uh, those clients on 6 are available. Uh, we are also working very closely to make sure there's band steering uh, so you can optimize the use of the legacy bands uh, as we deploy six gigahertz solution and then in parallel uh, it's really a solution play uh, you have to work very closely with the ecosystem partners on the fem side on the front uh, front end side to make sure that these are uh, robust solutions that support that extra uh, propagation delay uh, mitigations that allow it to be a good solution and from a reality standpoint all these products are actually being sampled today to our customers and to many others uh, in the industry as well so i think this rollout will probably start happening uh, tail end 2020 or early 2021 thanks chris uh, happy to answer any questions as well okay um <clears throat> thank you everyone and um again i think it's really interesting to see uh this industry from from all angles. You know, we've heard about from operators, we've heard customers, enterprise customers. Um, we've talked about industrial uh, solutions. We've talked about um, shopping centres, and now we're here talking largely about the consumer market. Um, and, and great to see what it looks like from your perspective about how um, things are moving. And if I understand it right, it's really mesh, mesh and backhaul and um, adaptive uh, applications initially. Um, but as I think you said, being very clear about the use cases and working with the, the ecosystem. So um, I think in the interest of time, we're going to move on now, Irvin. Uh, so thank you very much for your contribution. We'll move um, before we move to um, our next speaker. I want to get a, a sense of feedback from you on on the the attendees. When do you think you will deploy? You've heard about all the different uh, use cases, the technology. So just give us an indication of when you might be thinking of deploying, whether that's a trial or a full rollout. You know, is it pick any one of these? Is it this year, next year, 2022 or 2023 thereafter? Or in fact, if you've got no plans at all. So if you could just take a second to click one of those buttons and submit, then I will share the results. So, Sarah, when you think we've, we're ready? I can see my slide, but I can't see the results yet. There we go. All right, interesting. Um, what we're talking about, 23% this year. So we're halfway through uh, the year, June. And so 23% will deploy it's a trial or some other uh, rollout this year. And then we got to 43% of those on the call next year. So we got 66 this year or next year. Uh, another 13% 2022, 14% um, no plans and some you know, a bit further in, in the future. But so we're sort of basically saying in the next two and a half years, uh, 60, 70, uh, 80, 82% uh, is it, um, are, no, 72% um, are considering deploying Wi-Fi 6 in, in this period. So very interesting to hear. So and that you're on the right call then. Uh, we're seeing as well, Chris. I mean, from a silicon standpoint, we kind of tend to have a longer lead time in, uh, and that's actually matching pretty much our design cycle also uh, from, from a product launch standpoint. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you guys uh, on, on the call, all of you, hundreds of you have joined because you're, you're definitely on the right call if you're planning to deploy in the next two and a half years. So um, let's move on now to uh, thank you, Irvine. Uh, Gabriel, uh, Gabe Desjardins from uh, Qualcomm is our next uh, speaker. Yeah, and uh, Gabe is a, a contributor, strong contributor to uh, the WBA, Broadcom. Uh, on the board representing uh, Broadcom on the board of the WBA, um, his company, uh, big contributors to the, the, the Wi-Fi ecosystem, as you know, uh, have worked hard um, in putting the case forward for uh, six gigahertz. Um, and I'm delighted that Gabe can share his, his thoughts on um, enabling 5G services using the six gigahertz E uh, uh, product. Over to you, Gabe. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Thanks for having me here. 
So um, if you've seen Broadcom presentations in the past, uh, <clears throat> we've talked about how um, Wi-Fi 6E is critical to enabling and delivering 5G services. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, the Wi-Fi 6 and 6E ecosystem and how we're going to see that enablement. So I have um, four segments here, so I want to talk a little bit about um, what's happened in the Wi-Fi 6 ecosystem over the last year, talk about how um, Wi-Fi 6E is really the backbone of 5G services, talk about some of the trials we've done, showing some of the KPIs of Wi-Fi 6E, and then talk about um, what's next in the near term, not long term, but what, what's next in the near term in terms of enabling new, interesting, in this case, consumer applications um, in the Wi-Fi space. So um, Wi-Fi 6 launch has been one of the most significant, successful technology launches um, that, that I've ever seen. Um, you know, we're, we're trending, you know, we're obviously trending a little bit lower than we might otherwise because of um, COVID-19, but, um, you know, there's been, uh, you know, full acceptance of this feature across the broad market. Uh, it's become a must-have feature um, in phones, at the high end, um, and, and in access points. And we see just very, very wide proliferation um, going forward after this year. Um, six gigahertz approval, regulatory approval, is also happening. Uh, it's already happened in the U.S. And uh, so you know, this is going to drive uh, a Wi-Fi 6E launch um, late this year. Uh, you know, I expect a somewhat slower ramp up than, um, than Wi-Fi 6 itself, mainly due to, um, you know, it, it'll take some amount of time for uh, regulators around the world to enable the technology. But we still see a very, uh, very, very quick and significant growth here. And you know, by, by 2024, uh, probably more than 80% of all Wi-Fi 6 shipments will support 6E. And as I mentioned, the FCC has enabled this spectrum for Wi-Fi 6E in the U.S. So this is a hugely critical benefit here. Um, as, as Arvin mentioned, you know, it was really a challenge to make use of the 5 gigahertz spectrum to support 160 megahertz channels. But with Wi-Fi 6E and 1200 megahertz of spectrum in the 6 gigahertz band, we see that this is something that is really uh, very easily enabled by the new technology. And you know, we expect the U.S. rules to roll out in much of the world. Um, and you know, Europe will roll out something similar, um, starting with a, a three-channel allocation, and we expect long-term uh, for Europe to enable the same thing. So, but within you know two to three years, we expect to have you know a huge chunk of six gigahertz spectrum enabled around the world for uh, for new Wi-Fi six use cases. So, just talk a little bit more about how Wi-Fi six E fits into five uh, G services. This is something we've really architected from the ground up to work in conjunction with, um, with, with 5G. So uh, we created a wider bandwidth. Obviously, again, as, as Urban said, this already existed in prior technology, but now that we have more spectrum, uh, wider bandwidth is, is really a reality. Um, and then on top of that, uh, you know, there's no need to coexist with uh, legacy technologies in the 6 gigahertz band. So all Wi-Fi 6, E uh, devices will be fully scheduled. So this entire band will be fully scheduled. So everyone will be able to get uh, the benefits of Wi-Fi 6 in the 6 gigahertz band. If you look at how this fits overall into the ecosystem, it's not that Wi-Fi 6E will be the entirety of 5G. There's obviously certain cases where cellular 5G is the preferred technology and there are certain cases where, where Wi-Fi will be this, the preferred technology. And this is very similar to how it, how it works today. Wi-Fi is a preferred indoor technology, cellular is a preferred outdoor technology. So we, we expect to see that continuing um, as, as Wi-Fi 6E and 5G proliferate. Um, and you know, we've also, there are also technologies that have been added into Wi-Fi 6 to really improve the roaming experience between cellular and Wi-Fi. So for the critical thing here is that you know, 5G, the promise of 5G is something that uh, everyone's going to be able to see whether or not they have a cellular enabled device or not. Now, if we look at what 
six gigahertz does for Wi-Fi performance. It's it's pretty clear. You know, we've talked uh, quite a bit about how having wider channels and and more spectrum is going to lead to higher throughput. So we see a significant increase. Uh, and then uh, one thing that's been discussed a little bit less is the latency advantage. Um, having wide open spectrum, not having to deal with legacy devices, being able to get uh, you know, a guaranteed channel grant, that will help drive down the latency and enable some critical new use cases. Um, in particular, mobile AR and VR, which depend on very low latency human interface. So um, just to talk a little bit more about the trials, this isn't you know, just uh, you know, a, a lab effort or something on paper. Um, earlier this year, Broadcom and Intel went to the FCC to demonstrate the technology that, that we've been working on. So uh, you know, this was the first multi-vendor Wi-Fi 6E trial in the world, and we showed that Wi-Fi 6E can deliver on the critical KPIs I just mentioned, like throughput and latency. Um, but it also showed how you know, this is technology that is essentially ready for market. You know, as soon as the FCC uh, flips the switch um, and, and opens up the six gigahertz band for unlicensed use, we can essentially start shipping products. So this is a technology that is here right now. If you look at some of the KPIs that we showed in this trial, um, you know, we've talked about moving from 80 megahertz of spectrum to 160 megahertz of spectrum for channels. And nominally that would give you a 2X increase in throughput. However, what we saw operating in a fairly typical five gigahertz Wi-Fi 6 network versus a Wi-Fi 6 e network in six gigahertz was almost a 5X increase in throughput. And that's because there's a significant amount of congestion in the five gigahertz band, both due to a large number of devices and due to contention with legacy devices. These things are not going to exist in six gigahertz, at least not in the near term. And so we see a much larger increase, practical increase in throughput. Uh, similarly, we looked at uh, video latency and you can see we have the, the same phone on two different video links and you can see a time gap between those. So uh, we were able to demonstrate two milliseconds round trip latency in six gigahertz, uh, whereas we saw significant excursions in latency here, 120 milliseconds uh, by operating in five gigahertz. So it should be clear that you know, Wi-Fi 6E is able to deliver on significant improvements in throughput and latency. So where do we think these things are gonna be the most critical in the near term? Um, I think it's in this mobile Wi-Fi 6E space. So you know, this is really critical to delivering 5G services. You know, it's, it's one thing to talk about access points that are um, wall powered and are gonna deliver Wi-Fi 6E in the home. It's a whole other thing to be able to have a mobile device that can enable new uh, new experiences and new use cases for you. Um, you know, some of that will be in you know the screen sharing space, some of them in gaming. Some of that will be more in um, industrial spaces um, or in entertainment. Um, but it's uh, you know very much a technology Wi-Fi 6E that's been designed to give improved performance for, uh, for mobile users. And why is this consequential? Well, extended reality, AR, VR, other types, you know, this is really the next generation computing platform. There's massive investment across major OEMs uh, with major growth in sales of products, but there does not yet exist a wireless technology that uh, can enable these. Everything's a, a wired product at this point. So Wi-Fi 6E is the first technology that really truly enables this. So um, regulators are looking at a low power device class that allow portable operations everywhere, whether that's indoors or outdoors. And as I mentioned, very high throughput, improves video performance and ultra low latency is going to support uh, that critical human interaction with these types of devices. So just in summary, um, the value of Wi-Fi 6E is that it fills a gap in the architecture of, uh, of 5G. It fills the, the spaces like um, indoors where 5G cellular simply cannot provide the promise of 5G at uh, you know, quickly or, or at low cost. 
um, Wi-Fi 60 itself was also built from the ground up for use in six gigahertz and to enable all of these use cases and new products that I've described. And a critical piece is now that we're seeing this spectrum, in many cases, all 1200 megahertz of the six gigahertz band uh, being opened up um, and we see uh, low power portable devices being enabled, Wi-Fi 60 absolutely will deliver the 5G services that I described. Thanks, everybody. Th thank you, Gabriel. Um, re really nice presentation. And uh, t tell you what, guys, you're stimulating lots of really good questions. They're coming thick and fast. Um, I'm going to fit fit in one here, and then we'll save uh, the rest till after Rick uh, brings us home. So, um, really good question here. Um, do we expect 3GPP to develop in the six gigahertz band? kind of LAA equivalent for uh, six gig. Um, who, who'd like to answer that question, Gabe? Is, is that something that you, you want to respond to? Sure. So um, 3GPP has already proposed a technology very much like that um, called NRU or NR unlicensed. Um, and we expect this to get um, rolled out in, uh, in the six gigahertz band in the next couple of years. Uh, we look at it as a technology, again, that Wi-Fi is complementary to. Um, NRU is a technology that um, will, will work very well outdoors, is very well suited to outdoor deployments. Um, and at the same time, Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E um, are already making major strides on, on indoor deployments. So I think that you know, it, 3GPP is, is developing a, an extremely valuable um, 5G technology, and we'll see it working in the spaces where um, cellular technology has, already, has always dominated. Okay, very good. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on. And, and Rick, um, sorry, uh, yeah. So Rick Nedwid is the uh, WW Worldwide, I guess, Director of Education Comscope. Um, uh, yes. Good and, guess. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting practice at it today. Um, guessing. Um, Rick's going to. I'm glad he's worldwide because he's going to give us a case study about New Zealand. Um, down under, um, talking about education. There have been a few questions about universities. I think this is actually going to be about schools. But yes. Rick, could you take us through uh, the experiences that Comscope have had in deploying Wi-Fi 6 in education in New Zealand? O over to you. All right, super. Can you guys see my screen yet? Yeah, see your screen and we can hear you perfectly. Yeah, perfect. All right, well, happy to be here and um, fantastic run up on the technology of Wi-Fi 6. Um, I've had two careers, uh, first as an engineer and second as a marketer and, and business person within Comscope. And uh, it's amazing how much you forget <laughs> as an engineer until you hear other people talking. That was, that was amazing. Um, so I will be happy to talk a little bit about what Comscope is doing. Um, I come from the ruckus networks side of things. So from wireless, perspective. This is my sixth wireless company in my career. Uh, Comscope, if you haven't heard of it, famous for um, infrastructure, so structured cabling, uh, antenna systems, and so on. I'll show you that in a second. But a lot of basic research on starting out CBRS. So we talked about the shared spectrum earlier. Um, uh, some good early work with Wi-Fi 6. In fact, the first Wi-Fi 6 certified access point, the R750, which is now in the test bed to test every other Wi-Fi 6 device that comes out, and most recently, an industry impact award, uh, which we were happy to receive. So we do a lot, right? We say we build lasting connections, and again, coming from the Wi-Fi space, uh, historically, um, I'm very um, amazed at how much Comscope can pull together, whether it's residential broadband, um, and there was talk about um, smart home deployments. In fact, Wi-Fi Alliance has a, a specification for a smart home, but everything from core to edge is covered here, as well as the buildings. We talked about uh, airport examples, stadium examples, right? So venues, this would be schools, school districts, higher education. So whether that's small cell, DAS, Wi-Fi, fiber and copper solutions, uh, ethernet switching, um, SaaS solutions, uh, all of that covered. And then um, community or citywide with macro metro coverage, uh, again, with antenna solutions, DAS, small cell, and so on. So all of this comes together how when it comes to school. So again, I, I look at it from the education perspective. 
And so when I talked to a school, I said, this is this is overwhelming, right? So you don't need all of this when you're talking about how do I connect up some, some students with some Chromebooks in a classroom. But in today's world especially, there is a need to connect the students at home. So residential broadband matters, right? Of course, we need to connect them into schools, right? Within the classroom and throughout the halls. And more important than ever, we need to be able to reach out into the community. And this is never more important than it is today, right? So when the schools were closed, but distance learning needed to happen and there was a need for distance learning solutions. Um, and, and as the other speakers correctly said, there is no one solution for any of this. This could be, um, I mean, we work with service providers for cellular solutions for this, where it could be like a pocket MiFi device. Uh, it could be CBRS. We're looking at fixed wireless access with CBRS in the States. Um, and outdoor Wi-Fi solutions. So it could be a smart city coverage deployment. It could be outdoor APs uh, at the school or at a library or even on a school bus as an emerging use case. So all of these things become important now um, to provide this kind of coverage for home, school, and community connections. Now, I came here today to talk about what's going on in New Zealand. Um, they make the news today because of their fantastic COVID response, but it wasn't that long ago uh, that New Zealand had another issue, and that was a massive earthquake in Christchurch, New Zealand. I don't know how many of you remember that, um, but a devastating earthquake um, had hit in New Zealand. And what happened was a lot of the schools were either completely decimated or, or damaged enough that they needed to be restructured or severely remodeled. And some very forward-thinking folks said, look, if we're going to rebuild the schools, maybe we take this opportunity to adapt the way we teach for innovative learning environments or digital learning transition. And so there, this was a point where they stopped and started looking at uh, more dependence on Wi-Fi, more dependence on the use of screen time, the more dependence on digital curriculum delivery to create global uh, citizens and digital citizens. And so they came out of this in a way that actually earned them the kudos of ISTE, which is the International Society of Technology and Education, um, as, as one of the leaders in digital learning. And it was because, the, unfortunately, because of this, that they, they took the opportunity to reinvent themselves. Not everybody does that, right? It takes a, a huge event. Well, here we are again, sadly, um, with the global COVID-19 pandemic. And here's New Zealand again, shut their borders, shut their schools, as many did. I don't know if you guys realize, but over 80% of learners worldwide have been impacted by the COVID-19. Uh, 19 pandemic. Um, and so we're searching for ways to reopen schools or enable distance learning or both. And New Zealand is doing the same thing. They're saying, how can we adapt schools for social distancing, for distance learning when kids are away, and for digital equity, equity, equity excuse me, which means can, you know, uh, indigenous, you know, Maori students as well as more affluent students, anyone, they need equal access in or outside of school. So they came to um, many different vendors. We ultimately were happy that they chose Comscope and Ruckus, but um, to find a solution for their schools. Um, the portion of the Ministry of Education that we worked with uh, is their service provider arm is called N4L, Networks for Learning. And so it's their job to say, given whatever the Ministry of Education is saying we want to do with digital learning transition, it's our job to operate a student-focused network that's going to offer the schools and the Cura, which is access for everyone, again, digital equity, for affordable, safe, and fast internet service. So they are our customer. And I'm going to spend some time today not talking so much about the Wi-Fi 6 um, bits and bytes, but about end user requirements and needs and how Wi-Fi 6 is meeting those. So first and foremost, N4L has to provide fast uh, uh, broadband connectivity, right? So this is one of the reasons they were looking at Wi-Fi 6 and what we could do to help them with Wi-Fi 6. This is their number one thing. We need to connect everyone. Two, we need to protect the students. What does that mean? It means secure connections. So when those students are connecting in school and especially out of school, um, do they have uh, protection from harmful adult content when they're browsing or, or doing their work? And then of course, N4L needs to support this network everywhere, right? Not just in the network closet, but in the schools and everywhere it's used. So this is sort of what their service landscape looks like. Um, and I'll just kind of walk you through it from left to right. And you can see here, one of the biggest challenges that this country had, and we all do, but this country addressed first was uh, rural connectivity and broadband connectivity. So they recently completed an effort to get up to one gig uh, pipe to every school. That was a major upgrade. Um, and so now that they can do that, 
and go in through their router into the school. It goes through a firewall and a filtering process, right? So how do we protect the students? How do we make sure that only the right kids are getting connected to the right resources with the right level of protection? Um, so that ultimately the school can provide their own filtering portal and know who is using their network and protect them. Ultimately, the connectivity happens on the right here through whatever structured cabling they have pulled through their ethernet switching um, and from the ethernet switching out to the access points around the school and into the classroom. Now, the challenge here is once you start putting uh, capable devices, and I think someone mentioned it earlier, right? So more and more capable devices, smarter devices, it creates more bandwidth demand, right? So everybody here understands that. It's one of the drivers for Wi-Fi 6, actually Wi-Fi 5 first and now Wi-Fi 6. Well, with fewer physical ports in classrooms and schools, there's more Wi-Fi access. So now those Wi-Fi 6 access points don't just have gig ports on the back end, they have multi-gig, 2.5, 5 gig ports on the back of the APs. So they need to go into multi-gig switches. So they needed to upgrade their switches from single gig to multi-gig. So they're working on doing that with us as well. But now that you've got Wi-Fi 6 access points for uh, more devices uh, connected and multi-gig connectivity, now you have to look at your cabling. So traditionally, many schools, um, not just in New Zealand, but many schools in general, especially in the States, are still running Cat5e, which is an older standard of, of structured cabling, of copper cabling. And so that needs to be upgraded to something that can more sustainably support uh, gig or multi-gig connection. So Cat6 and Cat6a uh, is the next thing to go look at. So whether you're looking at fiber connectivity uh, to the IDF or MDF, or whether you're looking at uh, Cat 6A to go to multi-gig switches to connect to Wi-Fi 6 APs to support those new uh, Wi-Fi 6 devices that Broadcom and others are going to deliver, right? It's peeling these layers of the onion. And by the way, if you did all this without improving the WAN pipe, you wouldn't get any benefit, right? Because Wi-Fi 6 is driving the need for fatter WAN pipe. So all of these things had to happen for uh, New Zealand to realize gains for their schools. Again, and Pharrell is looking at it from the point of view of we need reliable, fast internet. We need equitable solutions that provide connectivity to all students anywhere. Um, and we need to do it in a way where we can do that is not just safe, but we can see what's going on. And so part of their charter is to be able to see what's going on at every school, at all connections, so they can gain insights about the quality of connection of their schools. So we're providing a management platform for them uh, called SCI that's giving them insight into connections and broadband. Uh, performance school to school. So what are they actually deploying? Well, there's 2,500 primary and secondary schools across New Zealand. They're managing a Wi-Fi 6 deployment using their own private cloud, using um, our smart zone controllers. They purchase our high scale uh, virtual smart zone solution, which they are hosting across two data centers for co-location purposes and for high reliability um, in multiple clusters with, um, as you see, 20 to 24 servers. So this is a highly scalable solution, normally, and off, I should say, often used by our service provider partners, which I hope many are maybe on this call. Um, but while service provider partners may deploy hundreds of thousands of APs across tens of thousands of tenant clients, we're talking about one customer, right, managing all their users together. Ultimately, they plan to deploy somewhere between 38 to 40,000 Wi-Fi 6 access points across these schools. Uh, the vast majority of this is going to be the Ruckus R650 4x4 AP, Wi-Fi 6 AP. On the back end will be our Ruckus ICX switch portfolio, about 12,000 switches running with a 10 gig backbone. As I mentioned, you got to have the multi-gig backbone to support the Wi-Fi 6 uh, bandwidth demands that all these devices and connections are going to have. And then ultimately we're securing the connections to all these devices and providing seamless roaming between, uh, between school sites using our Ruckus Cloud Path software for easy onboarding. And so now you know who's on your network and they have secured connections. So in general, this is what is being deployed. And I love the poll question about what's your time frame for deployment. For a deployment this big, they can't just simply go do it, right? So Enferel has reached out and hired 20 installer partners, 10 ICT service provider partners to sub out all the work because you got to touch 2,500 schools. Right now they're doing a 50 school pilot, everything from the smallest schools with maybe 100, 200 students all the way up to a largest uh, secondary school with up to 3,000 students. In their first year, they plan to deploy out uh, about 3,000 Wi-Fi 6 access points 
and the required switching and, and cloud path onboarding software. This is a four-year program. So, you know, we'll see how fast it goes. COVID has kind of thrown a wrench into the start date, but it's going now. So we're talking about in year one, 3,000 APs by year four, 38,000 APs. So that is quite a scale up um, over this time frame. Now, what are the goals and challenges here? I mentioned equitable access for all students in all schools, reliably fast for digital learning. Understand that the kids are going through a change and the teachers are going through a change where we're going from traditional textbooks and papers to a combination of that plus online learning. A lot of video-based content, a lot of distance learning, just like we're doing here. Um, you know, your kids are on, maybe you guys have all experienced this at home right now. They're, the kids are on Zoom calls or Google Meets or Google Hangouts or, or FaceTime chats and parents were on uh, GoToMeeting or WebEx or whatever, and we're all sharing that bandwidth and trying to connect, right? So we need reliable, fast connectivity with more video than ever. It could be security video, collaborative video, or could be, could be video-based content in the curriculum itself. Uh, more bandwidth demand, right? So it's a combination of more devices and more users connected. Uh, the fact that I've got fatter pipes to the school means I'm gonna be using it, and so there's more bandwidth because of that. Um, so um, more video curriculum, more video for distance learning, uh, more bandwidth on the WAN connection, all of those things are driving it. As we, as we knocked off or peeled off the layers of the onion um, with cabling, switching, APs, WAN, more bandwidth demand throughout, right? There was also a requirement for seamless roaming between the school sites so that uh, faculty administrators going from school site to school site could seamlessly connect um, and future-proof because they're deploying this over four years so they want a standards-based solution that is going to be relevant and useful for five years or more. This is a massive undertaking. This is the largest deployment they've ever done. It's the largest deployment uh, that I believe Ruckus has ever done. So it had to be standards-based and future-proofed. So when we asked them flat out, why were you interested in Wi-Fi 6 as a customer? This is what they said. We're seeing 30% growth year over year in bandwidth from our schools, and we don't see that slowing down. Part of the reason is we have more video content, I just touched on that, um, and we expect the video use to go up. Uh, we just put this one gig pipe to every school and we expect to make use of that. Um, another case, um, maybe similar to um, some of the other verticals that we talked about earlier, online exams requires not necessarily high bandwidth, but high capacity because typically everybody's connected at the same time, but high reliability, the network can't fail. Right. During an online exam, it can't fail, just like a production line can't fail. During online exam, and when I say online exam, don't think 50 minutes. Uh, online exam is typically something that an entire class or grade goes through. And so you may have one class taking an online exam, followed by another, followed by another. And so for an entire week, you could have online exams going on. And so there is a, um, a need for reliable connectivity throughout, right, and for a sustained period of time. One of the other impacts of um, the coronavirus is more devices. Now, why do I say that? Um, in many cases, schools could not afford one-to-one -one learning for all their students, and so they would share them. And you'd have you know, a rolling in a cart into a classroom and hand out Chromebooks or hand out laptops or hand out tablets. Uh, there's a concern now, a public safety concern, that we don't want the kids to share devices and touch what someone else has touched. And that's driving the need for more one-to-one -one devices. But if the schools don't have the budget for that, then they're accepting donations, right? So BYOD, if the, if the, if the families have devices and they meet a certain requirement, we'll use them. If uh, industry can donate them or, or uh, the government can, can make those available, then we'll take them. But it changes the paradigm, right? So now I need more one-to-one -one learning and I'm, I need to be able to support the bandwidth demands of more one-to-one -one learning. And I mentioned Future Proof earlier before. So Wi-Fi 6 just rolling out. We talked about how devices tend to follow two to three years after the standard. So the APs are rolling out now, which means the devices are gonna be rolling out in year two and three. So by year four, everything's humming along. Um, I just wanna mention just real quick. So we just went through our U.S. sales cycle. Um, those familiar with the government program E-Rate, this is where the government helps subsidize the cost of broadband to schools. Uh, this last year, I just looked up some numbers while the other speakers were going, I apologize, but about 70% of the access points requested by primary education customers in the U.S. this, this year right now for deployment this summer and end of the fall, 70% of the access points were Wi-Fi 6. So clearly this this technology, um, this standard is really hitting its stride right now. So what did the customers say about all of this, right? So 
This is from Kim Shannon, the head of education infrastructure services. Um, she really wants to make sure that her students have the right skills. I'm not going to read this out to you. You guys can all read this to yourself. Um, it's really about future-proofing education, F a future-proof standard that meets the requirements that I just walked through. From their perspective, from the customer perspective, they need reliable and super fast connectivity because they don't even know what skills those kids uh, are going to need, and they want to give them every best chance to thrive. I, I love that statement, right? We don't know what we don't know, so we're going to give them the best we can possibly give them for as long as we can possibly give them to enable these new modalities of digital learning and distance learning to give them the best chance to be successful. All right, that's all I had, Chris. I'll turn it back if there's any questions. Yeah, great, Rich. Um, guys, you're generating lots, lots of questions, and we probably don't have time for them all. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for a few. Um, Rich, questions that's come for you is what's uh, Comscope uh, thinking about home learning? Um, you, you mentioned that, but does your deployment is it schools only, or is there some hookup with with, with the students when they're at home? Yeah, it's a do you, great question. What, what's your involvement there? The this particular project was funded for schools only, but we are working with um, uh, communities and actually with the government of New Zealand to see if we can expand some of their smart city initiatives to provide broad coverage around communities um, so those kids will be covered when they're home. But that's, that is going to be a separate initiative. It's a good question. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rich. Um, I'm going to go to Gabe. If you're still there, Gabe, I can't see you at the moment, but hopefully you're still there. Can't no, hear you either. Here. You're trying to talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so here's here's a nice question from earlier. Uh, do you agree that indoor 5G cellular is expensive and probably not economic? Uh, 6E seems to uh, seems ideal to replace with an integrated access capability. I'm, I'm thinking maybe this is within uh, you know combination of maybe uh, cellular outdoor flipping into Wi-Fi indoor, but I'm guessing a bit um and you know, when when do you sort of yeah uh, do, well first of all do you agree that it's probably inexpensive uh, too expensive indoors yeah i mean 5g cellular has um very very high cost of deployment um you know i mean there's there's a reason that indoor venues um have primarily gone down um, a wi-fi path even well prior to wi-fi 6 rather than going down um, you know, a private uh, a private cellular path. I mean, it's just you know that much easier, that much faster, that much cheaper to go and deploy um, Wi-Fi. So I, I I definitely do agree with that piece. Okay, and uh, we won't get into the subject of DAS because you know Keisha will want to uh, take over that question. So, <laughs> but I, I know that that's that's a great solution for some environments, but there is that there is a, it's not not cheap either. Um, Another question for you, Gabe, before I move on to uh, Urban for the last uh, question. But um, what's uh, what's Broadcom's plans for 6E with connected vehicles and, and automotive generally? Well, ironically, that's probably a good question for Urban. Uh, Broadcom is <laughs> not um, in the uh, automotive uh, connectivity space. Um, that's mostly other Wi-Fi 6 slash 6E providers are in that space. Um, okay. And certainly, you know, that's that's a big thing for for on semiconductor. Brilliant segue over to Urban. Straight over to you, my friend. What Thanks, do you think Kate. about automotive? <laughs> so uh, obviously, we haven't announced any products yet in that space. Uh, but hey, look, we won't tell anybody if you wanted to share it here. <laughs> we'll keep it to ourselves. Uh, but uh, Gabe's point's valid. I mean, I think six gigahertz has uh, uh, the same uh, benefits in that space as well. So from our standpoint, what we view is, if you take a look at the upcoming clients, most of them will be tri-band as well. And that's definitely area we're focused on as well. And given our footprint on the uh, you know, enterprise, retail, or service provider focus, it does give you an opportunity to have a good end-to-end -end, uh, functionality benefit. And that's something we're definitely focused on. Okay. Uh, the the other question for you is which segments, market segments, do you see leading in, so in for, Wi-Fi six? So for Wi-Fi six, I think uh, all of them are deploying now. But for Wi-Fi six E specifically, with six gigahertz in the U.S. market, I think retail uh, would be the first one given the holiday season push. 
uh, this year. I think service provider will be very early uh, right behind it. And then I think enterprise will be mid uh, 2021 timeframe from a deployment standpoint. But all three segments are deploying. And then I think the mobile guys will be in Q1 and Q2 uh, deployment for next year as well. Okay, very good. Um, another question that's related to schools, but I'm going to ask you, Irvin, as, as you're there. Do you think Wi-Fi 6E also has a use case to provide high-speed backhaul to rural schools? I think not just rural. I, I think uh, in general, uh, given the fact that the 6 uh, gigahertz clients will not uh, have to support 2.4 or 5, it'll mean less congestion. I think it's going to be uh, generically across the board, not just for the rural market itself. Okay. Look, um, I, I'm I'm going to move us on because we're we're over time. We've I, I blame all the the questions that have come through, but uh, joking aside, thank you so much for your uh, response out there and and showing your your interest. Um, and so many, so many of you stay right to the to the end. And I know we've we've pinched a little bit of extra time, so I'm going to move on now. If we could move to the next slide, please. Um, or maybe I can share my screen. Yeah, perhaps my, my final remark. So um, I hope you found this uh, interesting, engaging. We've had a rich set of uh, use cases. We wanted to demonstrate the real tangible usage of this technology, not something theoretical. We wanted to show you this happening now. Uh, I want to encourage you to get involved. You know, so many of you said uh, you wanted to deploy this year or next year, or the next two and a half years. Um, so get involved. If you're not part of uh the w bay then please find out about what the work we do and please join us uh, the more the merrier if you're in the wba and you're not part of the, the, the wi-fi six work groups then why not join us uh, bring your project um and you know you, you you get access to the skills and expertise that you've heard here um i want to say a big thank you to our sponsors uh cisco intel boingo the charter sponsors the diamond sponsors Cognitive, uh, I thank myself at Global Reach, On Semiconductor, Huawei, Yconnect, uh, Maxis, and SDL. And if we just go on a couple of dates for your diary, um, tomorrow, if we go to the next slide, tomorrow we have uh, um, our next session on uh, open roaming, same time, same place. Um, You'll have to listen to me for a bit as well. I won't be moderating, but I am talking on, on open roaming, a subject that's dear to my heart. Um, I think this is another game changer. Um, it, combined with the, the moves on Wi-Fi 6, this really will make it so easy to bring so many uh, separate, disparate Wi-Fi networks into one, one place, make it so much easier to, uh, to connect uh, and bring them part of the ecosystem in a way that's never been done before. You know, cellular's got 750, networks globally have got a great way of, of uh, managing roaming through a, an industrialized standardized process we could be talking about um never mind 700 7000 700000 7 million wi-fi networks that could come into play as a federation and you've heard some of the use cases here today they could all be part of that federation and open roaming is, is a mechanism to do that so, I hope you can join us tomorrow. If you haven't registered for that, please do so. And then finally, just a word uh, about World Wi-Fi Day. Uh, on the 20th this weekend uh, is official World Wi-Fi Day, registered by the WBA, but open to all. Please share your, your uh, experiences, your desires to help connect the unconnected and do good with Wi-Fi. Um, I hope you found today engaging and so thankful that so many of you stay right to the end and we pinched a little bit of extra time so i guess you must have found it useful um please join again tomorrow uh, we've got some more great content and great speakers thank you so much goodbye